어머이 댕겨올게요 네 어디 가나? 정선 보러 아 <웃음> 그래 잘 댕겨오니라 야 <웃음> 축하여라 정선 보람 실천하여 밝은 미래 열어라 정선에 오신 귀하신 분들 반갑게 모셔라 <웃음> 그래 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 어서 오세요 어서 오세요 에이, 자 시작해보자고 울려 청선 포럼의 판을 열어라 다 함께 푸근한 
정선 포럼에 참여한 모든 분들의 노고를 위해 잔치를 열어라! 이야! 도평스나리 정선까지 오셨으니 아라리 한 자락 들어보시지요 아라리가 뭔가? 우리 정선에서는 아리랑을 아라리라 해요 아, 아 예전에 정선 때끈에게 들었던 기억이 나는구나 귀한 분들도 오셨으니 정선 아라리, 진도, 미량, 강원도 아리랑을 싹다 엮어서 한번 해볼게요 같이들 아세요 <웃음> 좋다! 풍악을 울려라! 네? 우리가 놀면은 날에 날마다 놀겠소 오늘같이 좋은 날에 육회 희만 봅시다 아리랑 아리랑 아라리요 아리랑 고개 고개로 날을 넘겨주게 
이방 마을 정선에 오신 귀하신 여러분 진심으로 환영합니다. <웃음> 저희는 2018년 동계올림픽 한국 전통극 대표 공연으로 시작하여 세계 속에 대한민국 대표 공연을 향해 나아가고 있는 정선군의 뮤지컬 퍼포먼스 아리아라리 공연팀입니다. 녹색 지구를 위한 모임 정선 포럼 그 취지와 실천이 더 나은 미래의 초석이 될 것을 믿습니다. 휴식이 필요하시면 언제든지 청정마을 정선으로 마카오세요! 마지막으로 아리아라리의 테마곡에 정선 포럼의 정신이 담긴 가사를 입혀보았습니다. 다 같이 보고 싶다! Good afternoon to all of you. Join us for the Chongsun Forum 2021. I'm your moderator today, and I'm Park Sun Young. And uh, it's actually been a while since I watched a, a musical performance, and the Chongsun Forum commenced a musical with the musical Ariarari by the Chongsun Cultural Foundation. And uh, this includes all these uh, videos and uh, live performances. And uh, Yoon Jung-wan is the director of uh, this Ari Ari musical. And I'd like to once again thank the Ari Ari musical troupe for their brilliant performance. And if it were not for the COVID-19 situation, we'd have this uh, hall uh, fully packed with the audience and we'll be clapping all the way. I find it quite regrettable that we won't be able to be joined uh, in this offline environment. And uh, we are going to look at the, the values that should be pursued for the global environment, the future generations, under the theme of our lives in a sustainable environment. And we have come up with uh, various uh, programs uh, uh, for this uh, forum, but because uh, we have to stop the spread of the COVID-19, we decide to hold online conference only. It is regrettable that we won't be able to meet in person, but we pledge to do our best to deliver entertaining attractions with meaningful contents. So please uh, bear with us uh, throughout this uh, opening ceremony. First, let me introduce the guests who are here for the opening ceremony. First to be introduced is the co-chairperson and chairman of the Kangwon Art and Culture Foundation, Kang gum -shi. Thank you very much. Next to be introduced is uh, from the SKENS, uh, the co-chairperson and vice chairman of and the CEO of the SKENS. Next to be introduced is uh, Che Mun Sun, the uh, governor of Kangwon Province. Chairman of the Kangwon Provincial Council, Kwak Do Young. Thank you very much for joining us today. 
Next to be introduced is Mayor of Cheongsan County, Choi Sung Jun. Thank you. And next to join us is Chairman of the Cheongsan County Council, Cho Sung Jun. CEO of Gangwon Tourism Organization, Gangwon Ki. Lee Samgol, the CEO of the Gangwon Land. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you to, very much for being here to, and honoring uh, this um, forum with your presence despite the COVID-19 situation. We adhere to the quarantine guidelines and will do our best to make a safe event for everyone. And uh, many dignitaries uh, join us uh, today with congratulatory video message. Let's put it on the screen. Thank you for the opportunity to speak through this video message at the Jiang Xiang Forum. My name is Jaime de Bourg Wagner. I'm climate envoy of the Netherlands. This is a time of emergency. Only a few weeks ago, we had such a massive storm in southern Netherlands, and there was a very concentrated downpour of water. Now, there's one thing we fear in the Netherlands, and that's too much water. One third of our country is below the sea level, so we have a lot of dikes and natural barriers protecting us from the sea. We have centuries of experience adapting ourselves and protecting ourselves against water. But sometimes too much is too much. And we had floods. They weren't as bad as they could have been, but they were pretty severe. And in neighboring countries, a lot of casualties were the result of these floods. And in Southern Europe, we're seeing increased heat waves. Um, I mean, really uncommon heat waves and resulting in a lot of fires in Sicily. We have them in Greece. We have them in Turkey. Um, we are already used to the fires in, in California as it's normal news. Uh, but also very exceptionally, we've seen fires in Siberia. So there is, hasn't been a more urgent time uh, to, to focus on these issues. So we're really looking forward to this forum. Our lives in a sustainable environment couldn't be more timely. Also, the location of the conference is, is quite astounding. I've been following the Olympics um, fanatically the last couple of weeks. And what I found was really remarkable is that there is a lot of competition, but there's very little hatred amongst the Olympians. Um, they're competing with mutual admiration, and they want to be able to beat each other. But there's a lot of respect in, in that sense as well. Um, and the Olympics really inspire us to, um, in a spirit of peace, to go faster, go higher, and be stronger. So going back to climate, I really hope that uh, we increase our speed, we set higher ambitions, and we make our economy and society stronger through this transition. Now, on the Republic of Korea and climate ambition, you really are becoming, using a sports term again, a front runner on climate action. Recently announced to become net zero by 2050, you pledged to determine the public finance, um, to terminate the public finance full plans overseas, and you bid to host the COP28. And, the, and you also announced to update your national determined contribution before COP26, so there's very little time to do so to keep global warming well below 2 degrees Celsius. And let us hope that other Asian countries are feeling your sense of competition and drive and follow your example. Now, phasing out unabated coal-fired energy generation is essential, and that's both realistic and cost-effective. We have chosen to do so by 2030, and we urge everybody else to do so as well. And we invite South Korea to join the Powering Plus Coal Alliance, which is an international coalition to accelerate the phase out of coal as an energy source. Now, that is not news to you. Um, already on, uh, on a regional base, the sub-national governments, including Gangwon province, have already joined this alliance. So now we're asking the central government to follow suit. Now, Jeonseong, which is the county where this event is hosted, shows that transition away from coal is possible and effective to restore after being coal mining province, uh, how to overcome the social and environmental impact. 
contract. So there's no more credible um, base to make the pledge uh, than, than where you are right now with this forum. Now, in the cooperation with the Netherlands, we, we have been in direct diplomatic relations with South Korea for over 16 years. Um, and, and so there's, there's a lot of camaraderie and, and familiarity in working with each other. And we hope that we can uh, learn with each, from each other and, and nudge each, each other going forward. And we're both advanced economies, so there's a lot of commonalities that we can look at. And uh, we're beyond coal, we're also looking at uh, phasing out coal, we're looking at offshore wind with many other EU countries who are happy to share information and, and ideas there. And also uh, the green hydrogen, there's very serious plans and looking at that as well. And we'd love to, to hear from you where you are with those and, uh, and, and share where you are thinking is going around that. So back to the Olympics, um, we try to aim higher uh, and go faster and uh, come out of this strong and uh, we're all on the same team and um, yeah um, i'll be visiting south korea hopefully soon i'm joining the board of the green climate fund so i'm probably regularly going to be in south korea so hope to meet many of you personally and uh, i wish you a very good forum and also a very inspirational discussion with uh, with a man i very much respect uh, which is jeffrey sex who i saw in your program all the best to you thank you very much Dear chairpersons and organizers, distinguished speakers and participants, ladies and gentlemen, let me first congratulate the Chongzong Forum 2021 on dedicating this year to six selected sustainable development goals in the sphere of environment and human welfare. The extreme weather events we are currently facing, heat waves in Korea, inundations in Europe and China, fires in North America, underpin once more the necessity to act swiftly. Contrary to initial concerns, overcoming the COVID-19 economic effects and tackling pressing environmental challenges are not incompatible. Just the opposite is true. Numerous countries have raised the ambition of their climate targets, amongst others at the P4G Seoul Summit in May, and earlier at the US Climate Leaders Summit. Rebuilding better, greener, and fairer during and after COVID is the only choice if we take the SDGs of good health and well being seriously. President Moon's announcement to end international coal finance is promising and important, as is Korea's commitment to become carbon neutral by 2050. What is now needed is a road. Germany, likewise, is determined to make the right decisions for our future. Investments in re renewable energy, biodiversity, and just transition will ultimately allow us to transform into a sustainable society. Certainly, the way to a carbon-free world will not be easy, and still much needs to be done. But in a concerted team effort, we can make a difference. As like-minded partners, Korea and Germany are joining hands in this endeavor. I am convinced that the Tongzong Forum will give us many valuable insights into how we can move green recovery forward. I wish you all the success and a productive session. Many thanks. Respected citizens of Korea, people of Gangwon province, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. First of all, I would like to extend my sincere congratulations on the opening of Chungsan Forum 2021. At a time when the world experiences a climate crisis through the extreme weather events such as wildfires, floods, and heat waves, it is very meaningful to have a Chungsan Forum held under the theme of our lives in a sustainable environment. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the three co-chairs of the organizing committee, Kang gum Shi, chairperson of Gangwon Art and Culture Foundation, Yu jung Jun, vice chairman of SKENS, and Maria Castillo Fernandez, EU ambassador to Korea, and all those who involved in organizing the event for providing us an opportunity to reflect on the challenges of our time and share insights. In particular, I would also like to express my special thanks to the opinion leaders from around the world who took their precious time to take part in. 
Pyeongsan Forum started as an international commitment to carrying on the spirit of 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games and to implement the Sustainable Development Goals set by the UN together with Gangwon Province and the international community. And this year marks the fourth anniversary as we live up to that promise. And this year, there will be many sessions in the forum, especially around carbon neutrality. Not long ago, the IPCC issued a stern warning about the global climate crisis, pointing out that the Earth is heating up faster than expected. And such transition to carbon neutrality has now become a task for all of us that cannot be put off any longer. The Republic of Korea is also preparing a net zero by 2050 scenario. And at COP26 in October this year, Korea will raise and announce its 2030 GHG reduction target. Achieving the goal of carbon neutrality will entail huge socioeconomic changes, but it is a path that must be taken for a sustainable earth and human life. This is why we are keen on having the insights of 33 experts, including Jeffrey Isaacs, the director of Earth Institute at Columbia University, who has urged the transition to a carbon-free economy, and Professor Che Chan Che, who has emphasized the importance of ecological vaccines. I sincerely hope that this forum will become a great venue to share valuable wisdom and draw international solidarity and cooperation for practice. Once again, congratulations on the opening of the Jungsan Forum 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have heard from the, His Royal Highness the Prince James Devon Bode Dapam of Netherlands and uh, the German Ambassador to Korea and uh, the Korean Prime Minister. We thank you for the greetings and congratulations on the successful hosting of the Jongsan Forum. We look forward to bringing the coronavirus to an end as soon as possible and hope that everyone will be able to come and join us at Jongsan next year. And uh, now we have a very special uh, session waiting for us. So this is going to be created in a 3D virtual environment. Lee Jae-hyuk is going to give us a VR performance. And it is going to be combined with a media facade and as a global citizen, uh, please stay with us uh, throughout the cultural opening ceremony for a time to discuss and implement the values and key visions to protect our future generations. And uh, shall we begin? Gangwon-do, having been the backbone of the Korean Peninsula all along, is situated at the center of the Taebaek Mountains along the winding mountain path. Over the Aryan Pass, this is where the spirit of the Korean people was formed and disassembled to be turned into a song. And this is Jongsan. Today, at this place, we would like to talk about human life and love. We want to shed light on our in yesterday, today, and tomorrow. In the beginning, the road was a pathway to life. All life beings gathered, breathed, and continued their lives along the path. On this rich path of nature, the steps of mankind arrived. The human race drank from water, rested, restored life, and began dreaming of another future. To find a new road outside the nature's path, the human race held the tools in their hands, which had previously been empty, and began to call out for each other, who had been previously anonymous. The humanity has paved a pathway of civilization over the path of nature. 
Under the banner of utility, the human race sorted things that are faster and more efficient, moving forward without knowing the end of it. We may have achieved high growth and the miracle of the Han River, but there was another shadow that behind such achievement, and we didn't want to see this. Korea's per capita carbon dioxide emissions were 13.8 tons per annum as of 2018. Used plastic dumped in Korea is 4.9 billion units or 71,400 tons per annum. Whose future are we borrowing from? Now is the time to find the answer. It's time to follow the exit sign that leads, reads hope, and therefore we are back to this place, Cheongseon, where the energy of the beginning is generated and the pulse of nature is running. The evidence of hope is in front of us. We must not lose sight of this sublime seed. From a time of the giving tree to a time of sharing and win-win spirit, it is time for us to, to move forward together. For future generations, we should guide them to take a better path for the future. We should lay the stairs, light the way, and give them full support. We call this path the path of wisdom that leads and begins in Jongseon. Beyond nationality, race, age, religion, and gender, we are gathered here to communicate with each other in the language of life. The path of wisdom that began in Jongseon will be transformed into the path of coexistence and lead the mankind into a new future. Now is the time to envision hope amongst ourselves. Hello, I am Seo Kyung Kim, an activist for youth climate action. I'm not great enough to represent my generation. I am just one of those who are campaigning for the climate actions to protect our rights as concerned parties.
If you think I am here on behalf of future generations, you are wrong. I am here as one of the concerned parties who are excluded from the discussions of our time. In fact, I still don't quite understand what the event is. The environmental forums I've seen so far have been events where people just gather and applaud and say that they care about the environment. Have any one of you in this room faced the climate crisis directly? Why are there not those who are directly experiencing the climate crisis in a forum like today's? What does it mean to hear the voices of victims? Is it a process of understanding the pain of a disaster that you have not yet noticed? Or is it simply listening to the voices of the vulnerable with compassion? I did not come here to hear about the bright future of our country. Don't talk about turning a crisis into an opportunity. If you call this an opportunity, why are you ignoring those who are in crisis right now? You are trampling on their safety and taking advantage of it. There still are too many coal power plants in Korea. Infinite growth is impossible on a finite earth. However, many people still do not seem to understand the seriousness of the threat of extinction and changes in ecosystems caused by ecosystem disruptions. By the time when today's others realize its seriousness, future generations might or may become core ourselves the survivors or victims. The climate crisis is not one of many events that we have in our daily life, but a very serious change that will overturn our daily life. What we have to do right now is not to nod our heads seeing someone's misfortune, but to face the reality and listen to the voices of those who have experienced the climate crisis first. It will be deceiving ourselves if we talk about starting with small actions because climate crisis is such a huge and difficult issue. It is turning our eyes away from it. I don't know what you will get from this forum, but I do believe you'll be discussing how to get rid of those coal power plants rather than talking about small actions. I know that it's a very uncomfortable story to listen to, but I think it's time for us to talk about this uncomfortable issue. And we all know that there are many ephemeral power plants in Gangwon-do, and once uh, the newly built uh, power plants are in operation, then they will be still in operation even after 2050, the net zero target year. If you really care about the future generations, you need to uh, discuss how uh, you can get rid of the coal power plants that will be still in operation even after 2050. Thank you very much. 네, 지금 우리가 느끼고 생각하... It seems that the environmental crisis or the climate crisis is way more serious than we assume. And the words of a young environmental activist touched my heart deeply, asking for urgent and action. So far, humanity has made a big progress by utilizing the finite resources of the earth. Now we are at a critical moment that we must work on sustainable values to create a world where we and our children can continue to live in and dream of. Various efforts are being made worldwide to develop alternative energy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to overcome the climate crisis. The Korean government has also committed to achieving net zero by 2050. Gangwon province in particular takes the lead in realizing carbon neutrality and implements various systems and policies to present a milestone for climate change response under the goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2040 ahead of the central government. Now, let me invite the distinguished guests who will make a promise for a world that our future genera generations can dream up uh, to the stage. Let me invite them to the stage right now.
to renew our commitment to net zero by 2050, we will start the timer on the screen. Those of you who are on the stage, please raise the solar panel right in front of you. Are you ready? At the count of three, please plug the panel you are holding in the cord. One, two, three. We have 28 years, four months, and 12 days until January 1st, 2050. I hope that everyone here today will live up to the promise we made today so that we can achieve the goal earlier. I promise to be with you too. This, conclu this concludes the cultural opening ceremony of Jungsan Forum 2020. We'll take a moment and we'll clean up the stage and we'll get started with the keynote a speech session participated by Professor Jeffrey Sachs under the title of a Master Plan for Carbon Neutrality in Future Eco Society. Thank you very much. And we'll take a moment to take a commemorative uh, group photograph. And
Sonyoung, and I'm the moderator. How was the opening ceremony? I hope that you've enjoyed the ceremony. Uh, through the emotion that vibrates through the Jeongsan Arirang and the messages delivered by the future generations, it was a time for us to think about the kind of efforts we should make right now. And also, um, I'm sure that you have high expectations for the programs that we have prepared for the upcoming programs. And I think this is the one that draws the biggest amount of attention from the audience. Let us now watch a short um, introductory video clip on the keynote speech session. And uh, we will be inviting the director of the Art Institute at Columbia University, um, and he's a world-renowned economist. He's going to deliver a live online speech shortly. And before the speech, we will invite the co-chairman of the Jeongsan the Forum Organizing Committee and the chairperson of the Kangwon Art and Culture Foundation, Kang Gyu-shin, to open the session. We invite the chairman, Kang, chairperson Kang, to the podium. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kim Shil Gang, and I'll be moderating the keynote speech session. I'm happy to invite Professor Jeffrey Sox, renowned development economist, and Jeffrey Sox, Professor Jeffrey Sox, also established Earth Institute at Columbia University and worked on the environment related initiatives since 1950. So let us invite uh, Professor Jeffrey Sox first for his keynote speech. And if time allows, we would like to have a short Q&A session with him. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it is really a, a pleasure and an honor to be with you at this very important forum. Uh, and greetings from New York in the middle of the night. Uh, but uh, how exciting to be up uh, and uh, awake and uh, listening to this opening session, which indeed was very inspiring. Two points uh, came to my attention in the opening just now. One was the call for values, sustainable values, uh, because really we're at a moment where ethics is the paramount question. Caring for each other, caring for the planet. We know that this is true in the middle of a pandemic. There is no solution to COVID-19, but cooperation, taking care of each other. And the same is true of our global environmental crises, climate change, destruction of biodiversity, collapse of ecosystems. We must cooperate with each other this is essentially a challenge of values. Thank you for saying so, so clearly. And thank you for the young people being so clear about the future. The second thing that struck me about the opening session was uh, when uh, the clock started, we saw 28 years till 2050. Oh my God, 28 years, that's nothing. Uh, psychologically, we may say, well, by 2050 or by mid-century, and uh, it seems like a long way off. But 28 years is a blink of an eye in terms of our lives on this planet and the uh, time that we need to make the changes for safety. In other words, we are so late to convert the energy systems for safety, that there is absolutely no moment that we have for delay. 
let me say that Korea is in the lead, and I'm not just being nice about it. I worked for Secretary General Ban Ki-moon for many, many years, and he put in place the sustainable development agenda for the world. So thank you, Secretary General Ban, and thank you, Korea, for that leadership. And also the scientific leadership of Dr. Lee, the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, one of your great scientific leaders. And the report that just came out from Dr. Lee's Intergovernmental Panel was shocking, of course. We learned <laughs> that we are absolutely in the middle of such dangerous human-induced change to this planet that we are already in the middle of a crisis unprecedented in climate change of the last 10,000 years. And we just learned a few days ago, though Koreans know it from what happened last month, that July was the warmest month on Earth in temperature record history, the warmest month ever. And incidentally, this was the warmest month in a time when we are in a La Nina phase of the Pacific Ocean, which typically cools the planet. So wait till we swing to an El Nino. We're going to have a further jump of temperature. As the uh, chair just said, I, I have led the Earth Institute for many years, and that means leading an institute with world-leading climate scientists. And it's a terrifying job because the climate scientists kept telling me it's worse than we think. It's happening faster than we think. And I was just in communication in recent days with uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Hansen, whom I regard as the world's leading climate scientist. He was the lead climate scientist for the US government for 30 years, a genius, a brilliant man. And he says we have accelerated the pace of warming, perhaps to a doubling of the pace of warming each decade compared to previous decades. And so <clears throat> we are in for a lot of warming in the short term. Now, what does all of this mean? in terms of what we need to do right now. Let me share quickly six key points with you. First, of course, we have to achieve climate neutrality in those 28 years, four months remaining, if not faster. That means every part of the planet needs to be on this same trajectory. There's no moment for debate no moment for the stupidities of uh, climate deniers who have made such confusion for so many years. We have a short period of time and we must act decisively. Not only do we have the new IPCC report, we have a new report of the International Energy Agency, net zero by 2050, which shows worldwide we can get there to net zero by 2050. We have the technologies in hand. Of course, we need improvements, but we have a path to success. Now, second point, Korea is on this path right now, and uh, I'm holding the 2050 carbon neutral strategy of the Republic of Korea, which came out in December 2020. This is an excellent document. It is, as I would expect a, of a Korean document, comprehensive, thoughtful, responsible, systematic, based on evidence, based on technology, which is Korea's strong point of being a technology leader, and recognizing the various components of the path to net zero. Those components are green power, we must produce electricity without carbon emission, whether it's wind, solar, or other ways. It is the hydrogen economy for the parts of 
the economy that cannot be directly electrified. It is electric transport. Uh, I'm sure that Korea is going to be producing some of the finest electric vehicles worldwide. Uh, this is a strong point of the Korean economy. And I'm sure we're going to make a very fast transformation worldwide to electric vehicles. The internal combustion engine vehicle is at the end. And we will be <laughs> transiting to uh, elect battery electric vehicles uh, very quickly, as well as to other modes of zero carbon transport. It is smart buildings. And Korea is pioneering many new technologies for zero emission buildings and all electric buildings. And it is for new industrial processes, such as hydrogen-based steel production. And again, Korea is a leader in uh, those technologies. So Korea's report is a smart, systematic, comprehensive report showing that yes, in Korea, this can be accomplished and that there are multiple steps to take across multiple sectors of the economy, power, transport, buildings, and industry in order to achieve net zero. Now, the third point that I want to emphasize is that Korea has three major roles to play. In fact, let me just say four major roles to play in this transformation. So the first role is to do it yourself. Make sure that Korea decarbonizes. And that is, of course, the preeminent responsibility of all of our countries. And boy, are we late in this. Of course, we had an absolutely crazy and irresponsible president in the United States for four years, the worst in our history, who delayed our process for such a long time, fortunately. We have a, 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 a rational and nice man as president right now, and uh, that will make a big difference for us. Korea is on the path. Do it. Number two, Korea will play a role as a global supplier of zero carbon technologies. That's a, a vocation of Korea as a world leader in technology. Korea will help other countries to decarbonize by providing the electric vehicles, by providing zero carbon shipping, by showing solutions in the steel sector, by helping other countries to build zero carbon infrastructure, by having smart digital grids, because Korea is one of the world leaders uh, in the digital technologies. So a second role for Korea will be as a supplier to the rest of the world of zero carbon solutions. A third role for Korea will be as innovator. Korea is one of the world's most dynamic innovating economies. Korea spends uh, basically uh, first or second in the world of research and development as a share of the gross domestic product. In other words, Korea has made it its economic vocation to be world innovator, to be at the forefront of technology, and has built an education system that is also superb, I can tell you, because I have had so many Korean students who are superb. And the education system supports a high innovation system. So that is a third role. And the fourth role is Korea is a thought leader worldwide host of the Green Climate Fund, for example, in Incheon. Uh, and I'm proud to have been a strong advocate of putting the Green Climate Fund in Korea as that decision was being taken. Because Korea, by hosting the Green Climate Fund, can help to uh, provide solutions for the whole world. Now, the fourth point I wanted to mention is some of the areas where I expect innovation to come. One is in the hydrogen economy, because we will need a hydrogen economy. Also, as the uh, Dutch uh, special envoy mentioned earlier, and this is taking shape uh, in East Asia and Oceania, uh, a, a hydrogen economy uh, involving 
Australia, involving Japan, involving Korea, involving China. Uh, and this is a very good point. Not only will this be very important for East Asia, it will be very important for the world, but I think there will be a lot of pioneering uh, on the hydrogen coming from Korea. Second is shipping, uh, because we need zero carbon solutions for shipping. And Korea is a lead designer and provider of ocean shipping. Uh, and still a key to this industry together with China and uh, other neighbors. And so this will be an area of innovation as well. Smart grids with Korea being uh, so advanced in uh, the pathway to a digital economy, we know that smart systems for energy efficiency, for managing uh, the uh, grid with the intermittent renewable energy sources uh, for the new uh, vehicles of the future, including what will be self-driving vehicles uh, used in a variety of ways, will require a smart grid. And Korea will be in the forefront of uh, 5G or 6G or 7G uh, in the coming years of our digital solutions. And of course, Korea will be uh, innovating in uh, the transport sector uh, across many different modes. Uh, the vehicles, the shipping, uh, perhaps uh, roles uh, in aviation, uh, in rail. Uh, and so I expect uh, in all of these areas, uh, Korean R&D to play a significant role. Now, the fifth point that I want to emphasize is the importance of regional cooperation, which is, getting harder perhaps than the technology because everything that involves human beings is harder than uh, when it's technological systems. We need cooperation within every region of the world. We really need close cooperation of China, Korea, Japan, with all of the historic challenges that that poses. The three countries are so important for problem solving. And I so much admire all three. And I know one fact that if Korea, Japan, uh, and China can work together, the technology powerhouse of the world will be in Northeast Asia. And the solutions that will come will astound the world and help to provide solutions for the world. But this means overcoming legacy issues, some of which are 75 years old or longer, but we need to look forward and cooperation is key. It's also essential because it's very hard to have a zero carbon energy system just within one country. It's very hard to have a hydrogen-based economy just within Korea. Hydrogen will be traded. It's very hard to have a power grid just within Korea because it really should be connected with Japan. It should be connected with China. It should be regional interconnection to help balance out the intermittencies. And so I really want to stress this point, which sometimes seems to work against geopolitics especially the United States has very bad ideas that we need to divide the world or we need a cold war against China or we can't cooperate or it's uh, our side versus another side. These are outmoded bad ideas of my country and we don't need this kind of division anymore. Uh, so I wanna emphasize that and maybe make one more point about regional cooperation. And that is the regional comprehensive economic partnership. The 15 countries that include the three in Northeast Asia, China, Korea, and Japan, the 10 in ASEAN, and Australia and New Zealand is a terrific grouping. It is a free trade area, but it's a great grouping for the climate solutions. Because within RCEP, within these 15 countries, you could make a hydrogen economy. You could make an interconnected grid. Uh, you could have green electrons flowing across those 15 countries. And I can tell you that all of the countries in the region need solutions together. I'm working with countries uh, in ASEAN right now. And remember, 
that Indonesia will host the G20 next year. ASEAN needs solutions. And by putting this RCEP grouping together, Northeast Asia with technology powerhouse, ASEAN, hundreds of millions of people needing green solutions. Australia, a major provider of the future hydrogen for the region, makes a, a very a tremendous uh, integrated region. And the sixth point uh, that I've already alluded to, but I want to emphasize uh, once again, is Korea's global role. Korea already plays a massively important global role. Uh, it was Korean leadership that brought us the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement under the masterful diplomacy of Secretary General Pan. And it is the IPCC under Chairman Lee, which brings us the best of the scientific information. Now, next month, uh, actually uh, end of October, I should say, the G20 will be meeting in Italy. Uh, a year from now, we'll be meeting in Bali, Indonesia. Korea has a major seat at the table. And with Korea's leadership, we could get the G20 as a group to move forward together and faster. The G20 is about 85% of the world economy. I'm uh, also advocating that it become the G21 by adding the African Union, another 1.4 billion people, to the table by having the African Union represented as the 21st member of the what is now the G20. But Korea can really play an important role in this forum. And it has the heart and spirit to do so because I see Korea's goodwill all over the world. I see it in Africa. I see it in other countries in need. Uh, I know it from uh, my uh, Korean colleagues and friends and students, and I so much admire uh, your country, and I know that this international role uh, is uh, one where you will absolutely play a magnificent role. Well, 28 years, four months, uh, and 15 minutes less than we had <laughs> before I started talking, uh, let me thank uh, you for having this citizens forum. One of the themes of the 2050 carbon neutral strategy is that this must be an action of citizens, of informed citizens. Korea has informed citizens. It has informed young people. It has a superb education system. Uh, it has a government of inclusion. Please use these uh, powerful uh, uh, attributes uh, and use your great success and technological knowledge for the global good. It is a matter of values. Korea has those values. Thank you so much for letting me share these thoughts with you today. 네, 감사합니다. Uh, 교수님. Thank you very much. Um, when it comes to the, the age of uh, globalization and the technology and institutions, your recent publications, uh, I'd like to inform you that it has been uh, recently published in Korea just last month. Uh, congratulations. I invite all the audience to join us and to read this book. I have a question for you. Now, when it comes to, to Korea, you gave us a lot of encouraging remarks about our um, pledges and what we can do, the six points that you have made that was greatly inspiring. And you talked about the cooperative mechanism, and I believe that we need to create a global community and through a cooperative mechanism that we would be able to bring substantive changes, positive changes. Now, you are in the United States, and therefore I'd like to ask a question from, from the Korean perspective. You would see that um, uh, the United States would uh, join the international organizations and withdraw from the organization it would impact other countries greatly. There is certain instability that because of the, the government that comes in and out, goes in and outside the US, uh, the, US uh, the presidency, and uh, that can bring some instabilities. And also the IPCC uh, report said that, that uh, the rising temperature, uh, the pace of the rise is much faster than we anticipated. And therefore, although we are making efforts, people are having doubts as to whether the efforts are going to be meaningful. So on these two points, I'd like to ask your thoughts. What's your take on these? 
Thank you very much. Uh, let me say that, uh, well, thank, thank God uh, we got rid of Donald Trump. Uh, as I said, he was a very dangerous man and a very, uh, very misguided uh, person uh, without the values or the knowledge to be president. And uh, President Biden, whom I've known personally for 30 years, is a very decent man. Uh, and he's very committed to what we're talking about today. But I also have to tell you, the United States remains a politically divided country. Uh, we are not in good shape. Uh, our culture is not functioning properly. People have very confused, even very dangerous ideas about freedom. Uh, you know, in America, freedom is the watchword, but People think freedom means freedom to be reckless, freedom to be irresponsible, freedom not to wear a face mask, freedom not to get a vaccine, freedom to pollute. So it's not a smart kind of freedom, but it is part of American culture, not all of it, but part of our society. So we're really in the middle in the United States. Uh, it's, it's called a culture war. Uh, I hope it doesn't come to a war, certainly, but it is a very difficult situation. And President Biden has, uh, <laughs> if you could say a majority in the Congress, well, it's 50-50 between the two parties. If it's a tie, the vice president can make the tie-breaking uh, vote. So President Biden can pass some legislation, but boy, are we divided in the United States. This means we can't uh, wait for the U.S. to lead, certainly not. Don't even think about U.S. leadership. We just want U.S. cooperation. Uh, we've seen the debacle in Afghanistan in recent days. We, we need cooperation among many, many countries. We can't count on the U.S., but we have to help and work for the U.S. to be a normal part of the world right now, a constructive part. This is certainly President Biden's idea. And uh, I'm really hoping for his success and his administration's success. It's filled with friends of mine and colleagues of mine and uh, trying to do the right thing, but in a divided culture in the United States right now. One of the bad ideas coming out of America is uh, a very anti-China sentiment. And this I find very dangerous because we need cooperation with China. Uh, we need really better understanding. I think in, in your neighborhood, you know and understand that. And I think the opportunities are there for cooperation as well. Uh, and so this is an idea that I'm not very happy about coming out of the United States. We need to lower the temperature. We need cooperation. We need to stop sanctions everywhere. We need to stop uh, all of these difficulties because we're not going to solve our real problems if we're fighting with each other. We're only going to solve them if we're working together. You ask about, can we do it? And uh, just to conclude on that point, yes, but just barely. Uh, and we are so late uh, that we need to do what the International Energy Agency said clearly, not a single new investment in fossil fuel technology or infrastructure right now. We need to move. No more coal plants. This is a message I repeat to friends in China. And it's true across the region. To Australia, stop your exports of coal. We can't go on this way. And so, we are so late in the game. And temperatures are now rising probably at a rate of more than 0.3 degrees Celsius per decade. So we could breach the 1.5 degree limit within the next 10 years. But that doesn't mean it's over. It means, my God, let's hurry with the solutions we know and take every opportunity for maximizing investments. And one more point that I should mention, what the governments in developing countries say to me every day is we want to do more, but we need help 
with the technology and we need help with the financing. And so we need to construct a financing system where it's not just the rich countries that can borrow at low cost, but also the poor countries. And for that, we need a bigger role for organizations like the uh, Green Climate Fund, the uh, uh, Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, the uh, Asian Development Bank, and other multilateral institutions to enable the scale of financing that developing countries are really begging for. They want to move, but they need the financing to be able to move. So this is one of the key changes that needs to be made. 네, 교수님, Thank you very much for your insightful answer, Professor Sox. And thank you for your kind and lengthy answer, uh, despite uh, my lengthy question. So from the perspective of Johnson Forum 2021, um, it's a great pleasure and honor to invite uh, such a renowned and um, great uh, development economist, uh, Professor Jeffrey E. Sox. So we are going through a lot of difficulties in the midst of a pandemic. However, we need to join our hands with our neighboring countries and the countries in the region and the international community. And Korea can play a leading role taking um, the leadership in the international community, providing all the needed support as uh, much as we can. And that's the kind of key message that, can, that we can take away from the keynote speech session of uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you very much for your time. Well, uh, we just had a Q&A session to participate by Professor Jeffrey Sachs and uh, the chairperson, Kang geum -shi. And we have heard a lot about cooperation. And given the time constraints, we would have to let uh, Professor Sachs go. Uh, but uh, I'd like to ask you to uh, make closing remarks, if possible. Can you give a few words to the Korean audience? I want to say uh, that I want to be with you in person as soon as possible in your beautiful country with the beautiful people. Uh, it's uh, so nice uh, to be connected uh, this way right now so uh, we can uh, be with each other uh, and move forward together, but I'm coming in person soon, so I, I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much, and thank you for your leadership uh, for this important forum and for all that you are doing for the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Professor, for your message of support and hope for the audience who are rather exhausted at these days from the prolonged corona situations. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs for sharing his insights on the values to be upheld by individuals and states, and the Chairperson Kang Gumsi for navigating the Q&A session on our behalf with excellent questions. Before we wrap up the keynote speech session, so we would like to, to present you. Actually, the making process has been um, done, shown uh, during this lecture. I would like to present you with a visual thinking drawing that shows the contents of the lecture. Let's try to take a look. Well, the screen shows a clear picture of Professor Sachs' speech and the conversations with the Chairman Kang. The drawing will also be posted later on the Jongsan Forum's Instagram account. And we look forward to your visits. We'll now take a break and have an invited lecture by Professor Choi De Chun. During the break, we will be holding various events for the online audience. So please don't miss out. And I'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you.
네, 안녕하세요. 다시 인사 올 Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me say hello to you again. My name is Park Sun Young, and I'll be moderating the special lecture session. Um, it seems uh, that um, you haven't seen um, the today's special lecture speaker yet. We have two people on the stage. They are the youth uh, panelists who were actually uh, selected through pre-registration. And these young people are passionate fans of the speaker of this special lecture and are interested in environmental issues. On behalf of the viewers, they will ask questions to the speaker and seek for advice for future generations. I would like to invite the speaker who will give a special lecture on the theme of ecological turn for the post-pandemic life. Professor Che has been observing nature and practicing knowledge and love for life all through his life. He is a chief professor uh, at the Department of Eco-Science at Iowa Women's University, and he recently released a book called uh, Ecological Turn for a Wise Life on Earth and actively communicated uh, with the public. Please welcome Professor Che Chen Che. He will be joining us. Uh, us online. Please begin your lecture, Professor. Uh, I'm delighted to meet you all. And uh, it's quite sad that we are not able to meet uh, in person and uh, just meet across uh, the, the screen uh, because of the COVID-19 situation. I sincerely hope that we will be able to see an end to the COVID uh, pandemic and that we'll, be, that we'll be able to sit down together for a nice chat in the future. So let's uh, persevere a bit more. In the morning, uh, to, with uh, regards to WHO website, I logged onto the website and I uh, checked myself, uh, and I was able to find out uh, that uh, uh, the more than 200 million people have been infected from the COVID-19 virus, and more than 4 million people mm -hmm. died because of the virus. Actually, the, the number is going to be something closer to 4.3 million. To, uh, and according to The Economist, uh, a world-renowned magazine, uh, um, just a few months ago, there was an article. To, and when we come up with the statistics of uh, the, the death toll the numbers, so to say, uh, because of um, the pneumonia and so on, so the elderly group um, pass away, and we sometimes um, cite the cause of the death as pneumonia and not COVID-19 virus. So there is a tendency of underestimation to, uh, in the statistics, and uh, the economist has said that perhaps more than uh, 13 million people died already in this article, which was released a few months ago. And uh, from someone who studies biology, I think uh, this is an uh, absurd situation. To think about it, virus is not really the, a live uh, being. It's uh, not capable of uh, leading a life. It's a passive being. It uh, floats around and it would stick to someone else, uh, it would go inside the cell of someone else, and the cell is um, going to grow genetically, and the virus is going to slip inside the genome, and it's going to sit there, and then uh, it's going to be the reproduced uh, along with the genome. And uh, that's what uh, essentially a virus is all about. Uh, so it's just a small piece of uh, the DNA. And human beings who have um, been so proud to say that we are the supreme beings among the, the, all the species, uh, we are being defeated. And this is such a discouraging thing. But this is not the first time that such a thing has happened. Uh, because of the COVID uh, the virus, uh, the coronavirus, we have been uh, bashed about three times already. There was a SARS, there was a MERS outbreak, and then we had the COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, 
they all uh, come from the same root, uh, which is in the cause, which is the bat. Is it because uh, the bat is especially dirty or evil that they uh, create this uh, spread? That's not the case. It's because there are just so many of them. So there's a paradox in this. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the diversity of uh, the species, uh, for the mammals, uh, the large bulk com is, uh, has to do with the rat, and uh, the rest uh, has a lot to do with the bat. And so uh, when it comes to, to the, um, uh, the, the disease uh, that affect uh, the, the mammals, the human beings and animals uh, together, the zoonotic uh, the, the disease, uh, a lot of that has to do with the bat. So it's not as if bat has uh, some grievances against us. There's just so many bats around us. But the problem is that uh, uh, we did not uh, get the virus uh, from the bats uh, directly. Uh, for SARS, uh, it came us through civet, uh, which is a type of the cat. Uh, and for the MERS, it was the camel. And uh, according to the current findings, uh, this uh, pangolin, uh, which has a very peculiar appearance, uh, is known to be the intermediary of uh, uh, this coronavirus from bat to human beings. So if you look at the wildlife, uh, if you look at the wildlife environment, if they're let uh, to be, no such thing would happen. The outbreak will not happen. But uh, we destroy their living environment. Uh, we interfere with their life. Uh, we catch them. And we uh, create a pain uh, on their part. Uh, and this is what happens. Uh, so uh, we have earned it, so to say. And uh, I believe that uh, we are uh, now suffering for what we have caused. We have been asking for it. Uh, um, is there some uh, correlation between the climate change and this pandemic? Many people raise this question. And uh, according to a the publication by Cambridge researchers, uh, they came with a very persuasive explanations uh, on the background. What they studied is uh, to look at uh, the uh, species. Uh, largest, the largest amount of the bats would live in the tropical area. Uh, the, the absolute number of uh, the bats would live in the tropical area. Because of the um, global warming, what happens is that they would, the temperature will rise. So uh, the bats would move up to subtropical area as well. So they, uh, the Cambridge researchers looked at uh, the pattern of living, the pattern of habitat for the bats in the last 100 years. And uh, the biodiversity hotspots have been created for the bats. In other words, we have the border regions. And most representatively, we have the southern China region. In the last 100 years, uh, more than 40 types of species uh, have uh, relocated uh, to this region. And uh, for a tropical bat, uh, uh, they typically are known to carry about two to three types of the coronaviruses. So it's, a, it's a 40 uh, times two or three. So it's at least 80 to 120 new coronaviruses being created in the, the southern Chinese, China region. More than 100 new coronaviruses have been uh, imported to the south of South China region, and one of those uh, viruses uh, have emerged to attack us this time. So uh, between climate change and the outbreak of the coronavirus, uh, there is a strong uh, correlation. I believe there is a strong probability that there is good correlation between the two. Now, when I uh, talk about uh, these things, you may feel rather um, awkward or strange in that uh, so many people suffered uh, from this uh, outbreak. So many people lost their lives because of the outbreak. And I can uh, say with um, confidence that the virus will not uh, drive us uh, to extinction because virus is a the passive being. So 
uh, there will come a point when the virus is not able to affect the human beings and uh, it will be the end of the virus. Of course, the pest is not virus. It's, uh, it's a germ, germ spreading out in the European continent, and they only managed to kill only about one third of the European population. Of course, it's a large number, but uh, we could ask a question like this. Why was the germ pest uh, not able to affect uh, the remaining two thirds of the European population? It's because they were not able to spread uh, the um, it, infection. So we, if, uh, large amount of large number of people die then one day the, the virus will uh, uh, be demolished but the climate change is a different issue we have no place to hide and uh, climate change is going to affect us uh, to the very last uh, person standing on earth and this is indeed a scary thing this is incomparable to uh, the coronavirus this is going to be disastrous uh, for the human beings that's what we the biologists are concerned about so as we go through this uh, covid-19 situation some of you may feel that Perhaps we've been too hard on the nature. Perhaps we sh if we continue to destroy nature, uh, life will is going to be more difficult uh, for us. If uh, there are any of you who have felt so, I like to say that this is the, the right time that we give some serious thought to, to the issue of climate change, climate crisis, uh, that we bring fundamental changes to the way we lead lives. Now, of course, uh, this uh, famous uh, celebrity, uh, the former Vice President Al Gore, he was not elected President of the United States. Uh, perhaps it's because of the rather unique, uh, peculiar presidential election system. If uh, he was in Korea, he would have been elected as a U.S. President. Uh, so he had the majority vote. Uh, but because of the electoral vote system, he was not able to uh, be sworn in as the U.S. President. But even if he wasn't the President, uh, he became a more a famous celebrity. He uh, has more stronger influence as an individual now. He has authored a book called Inconvenient Truth, and he has made a documentary out of this book, and he has let the world know about the danger of the global warming. And he was uh, given the Nobel Prize because of his achievement. And uh, I really applaud all his achievements and efforts, uh, but I'm sorry to say, Mr. Gore, uh, you are a, a Nobel um, laureate, uh, but the outcome that uh, you have achieved, uh, I have some questions about it. Uh, this is what I want to say. Truth is has become a lot more inconvenient uh, than the, before. The, um, so Mr. Argo said that uh, the truth is inconvenient at the time he published the book. Uh, but despite your efforts, uh, Mr. Argo, I believe that the world has become a lot, the truth has become a lot more inconvenient. And this is the harsh reality that we face. And we have to do the, something uh, drastic. We need to take drastic measures to bring changes. And now uh, there are celebrities like Al Gore who make efforts. Uh, and uh, there are the experts, the so-called experts. And among those experts, uh, I find uh, that uh, some uh, believe that uh, climate change is a mere conspiracy theory. I just don't know what goes on in their minds. I don't know where their, where their rationale come from. Because uh, the statistics uh, give us uh, uh, the truth. We just started recording temperatures since 1880. And uh, between 2015 and 2019, are the top uh, five highest temperature years. So what? One could only ask. This summer was extremely hot. And after this year, uh, some may say that uh, this uh, was the year with the highest temperature recording. It's quite likely. And we have clear evidence for the global warming, uh, yet uh, there are a certain group of experts that, that deny this uh, crisis. I wonder what's going on in their minds. 
And these are the people, the group of people that would feel the highest level of inconvenience. Those who uh, emit uh, carbon uh, emission, uh, carbon, uh, they live in the uh, subtropical uh, the climate, uh, like United States, uh, China, and others. Uh, but those who suffer most are people in the Tuvalu, uh, who are in the South Pacific region. They don't have refrigerator. They don't drive cars. Yet. They suffered because uh, uh, people in the advanced countries uh, lead uh, comfortable lives, uh, convenient lives. Uh, they use uh, the uh, all these different tools of the civilization. And the end result is the pain suffered by people in the South Pacific. Uh, but I uh, think it's very, uh, there are a lot of us who felt sorry for these people in the Tuvalu and other countries. Uh, uh, there are some people who felt that we need to take actions uh, for the, uh, less pain to be inflicted on these people. But we did very little, and time was wasted. Uh, and we felt that uh, this is not something that's going to uh, be it, uh, uh, falling on the, on the countries, uh, advanced countries, uh, but Netherlands and Germany. The, uh, many countries in Western Europe have suffered uh, severe floods. Uh, Last year, we also felt that uh, we experienced this uh, because uh, last year we had uh, more than uh, 50 heavy rain days. We always uh, assumed that, that uh, the pain is felt by the poor countries and well, sh we should be providing aid as a more advanced country. We should be providing aid. We should be the volunteering for help. But because of the COVID um, outbreak, we came to understand that things are quite different. Uh, Many people they felt that, that advanced countries are free from such threats, but uh, uh, countries like uh, the European countries, the United States, uh, um, many people died in these countries. Uh, they suffered a lot. So I believe uh, that um, the, the way that the pain is being afflict afflicted uh, is going to change substantively. It's not as if uh, someone is uh, causing the pain and there are others who feel the pain. Uh, I don't think there is any single country that will be really freed from uh, these uh, catastrophic situations. And uh, at this Jongsun Forum, uh, uh, we have selected the sustainability as one of the main themes uh, for the forum. Sustainability can be described as um, something that can be done so that the future generation can enjoy the benefits of the nature as much as we do. This is the concept of sustainability. So the, we, the, uh, we have been saying we were not able to meet in person, uh, but we felt that our grandsons, uh, grandsons, our future generations, uh, we felt that uh, uh, if um, our future generations are going to suffer so much, uh, we should be doing more to, to protect the environment and take actions. Uh, we always uh, talked about uh, making efforts, uh, but we took very little actions. Uh, and uh, we were very concerned. We assumed that we had a lot of concerns about the future of generations where they were not able to meet. Uh, but uh, things are going to change. Uh, this have changed significantly. We are suffering. It's not the future generation. It's our problem because we are suffering. We're not taking uh, good actions on behalf of our future generations. It's something we have to do to ensure our survival. We have to change the pattern uh, that we lead our lives. And uh, IPCC they released a six report recently, and uh, IPCC releases a report every seven years or so. And whenever IPCC publishes a report, uh, the world uh, um, acknowledges the report and they promote the, the contents of the report and so on. And uh, uh, this report has been particularly well received. Uh, you will see that, that the IPCC is chaired by a Korean nationality. Dr. Lee hae sung is uh, the, the uh, top leadership at the IPCC. I really applaud his leadership, outstanding leadership. I. When it comes to the CBD, the, this is known as the Convention on, on the Biological the Diversity. I served as the chair of the CBD for about two years. And having served at the top position at the international organization, I just came to be mesmerized at the daunting task I've been given because it's really difficult to be able to lead an international org uh, the organization. You have to reflect the different opinions of the member countries. You end up doing nothing because of that. So it's a really daunting challenge. And in 2018, 
Ewan was elected as the chair, and uh, under his outstanding leadership, he was able to persuade all the, the scientists uh, under the IPCC umbrella, and uh, uh, all the world leaders uh, came together and. Uh, they uh, looked at uh, the rise of the uh, temperature, and they all agreed to um, hold the limit to, they, they were discussed uh, to make sure that the limit, upper limit is set at two degrees, and they were not able to come to a conclusion. They just did a talk, all the talks, and uh, uh, did very little to achieve the conclusion. Now, if there's a rise of temperature by two degrees, what we believe is that uh, the biodiversity that we have, uh, about half of that biodiversity will disappear. That's the kind of estimate that we have as biologists. Uh, so we believe that uh, two degrees is uh, too uh, high a limit, uh, yet the world leaders are not able to come to a conclusion to over the, the two uh, degrees of limit. And uh, Li Hui-sung uh, um, held a, hosted a conference at Incheon, uh, and he managed to reduce it uh, to 1.5 degrees. Uh, and uh, we, um, there are many of us who are saying to uh, Dr. Li Bai-sung that 1.52 degrees is too high. And uh, this, agree this uh, was uh, decided in 2018. And in 2018, uh, uh, 2050 or 2050, that was the time limit set, set for the uh, rise in the temperature. And um, that was the estimate they had in 2018. In 2011, the IPCC report, uh, now IPCC said that uh, uh, they, we believe that it's going to be achieved very soon because it is only about 0 0.4 degrees away from the limit. Uh, so it will be about 10 years um, or perhaps uh, 15 years at the latest uh, for us to, to achieve, uh, to, to arrive at this limit uh, of 1.5 degrees. Oh. So I'm not a Catholic, but I believe that we need to remind uh, what Francis, uh, Pope Francis uh, said. I do have a great respect for him, and I think uh, the comment that he had made uh, in November 2019 uh, is worth our notice. He mentioned that um, we need to actually include the ecological scene into the original scene. I am a scientist, so I cannot give a holy explanation on this specific comment as Pope Francis uh, did. Uh, Pope Francis said that God created all the living things uh, on earth. So uh, all the living things or the beings on earth are the creatures of God. And that's why uh, all these creatures live, uh, should live in harmony. However, if one specific creature um, breaks about its physical strength and do harm to other creatures, what would happen? I would not tell you what this specific uh, a strong creature is. Uh, you may understand that I'm talking about Homo sapiens. So as it was mentioned by Pope Francis, all creatures are created by God, but one specific creature, Homo sapiens, give a hard time to other creatures, kill them, torture them, and make them suffer. So I believe the announcement made by Pope Francis is very meaningful and timely. After Pope Francis made this specific uh, comment, last, in less than two months, we started suffering from uh, COVID-19 caused by coronavirus. So we are talking about the issue of uh, climate change. And we all know that climate change issue uh, goes with the biodiversity issue in parallel. So since uh, the human kind started the recording history, uh, the recent uh, the climate change caused natural disasters uh, to uh, the highest number of casualties. So UNFCC designated me as a honorary ambassador. It was a great honor for me to serve as a, an honorary ambassador. 
UNFCCC hosts diverse events in various places around the world. And I was invited to give a lecture on the seriousness of climate change in those venues. And whenever I visit different places for lecture, I happen to have a lot of people who told me that they were deeply touched by my lecture. I am a biologist and I actually worked on uh, the activities made by the biodiversity-related international organizations. So many of my colleagues have a great expertise in biodiversity, and their overall opinion is that biodiversity is closely related to climate change. However, the climat climatologists uh, do not know a lot about biodiversity. They actually do not. Uh, have much knowledge about biodiversity. But what I can tell you today is that actually biodiversity related issue is more uh, serious and more dire than climate change. So we can actually take measures or actions to alleviate the climate change issue. We actually also can deal with extreme weather events. For example, if a summer is too hot, we can use air a conditioner. But if uh, the same um, level of the extreme weather conditions happen uh, to animals, then they would not have any uh, means or uh, the measures to take to deal with them. So. Uh, Actually, many uh, the members of my audiences of the special lecture said that uh, my lecture was uh, eye-opening um, the contents because um, they didn't have any chance to have a, to uh, create a connection between climate change and biodiversity. Uh, now, you may know the concept of uh, blue ocean. Professor Kim Uchan at NCED, which is very prestigious, uh, the business school, uh, mentioned uh, this term, blue ocean. And he said the blue ocean is an attractive market where there are no dominant players. And to the best of my knowledge, or as far as I understand, the current environment, uh, which she is uh, dealing with this biodiversity issue is a blue ocean for viruses. So it means that the viruses uh, make huge heat in this blue ocean of uh, human beings and animals. Let's take a look back on the human history. The Homo sapiens came into existence on Earth uh, like uh, 250,000 years ago. And the first 240,000 years, the human beings or the homo sapiens were helpless uh, being. They just chased by the animals like lions. But actually, the homo sapiens made a huge progress for uh, the recent uh, 10,000 years uh, with the introduction of agriculture. So when the homo sapiens came into uh, the existence on Earth, uh, they were kind of hapless uh, beings. And based on the DNA research, it seems that uh, people studied uh, breeding a, a dog like uh, 40,000 years ago. And it seems that, or it was found that uh, the Homo sapiens studied agriculture like 15,000 years ago. And even before the agriculture is started uh, as an industry on Earth, uh, people kept dogs and all the mammals and the birds on Earth take lower than 1% when it comes to uh, the entire uh, living uh, beings uh, or things on Earth. But for the past 10,000 years, Homo sapiens or uh, the human beings uh, went through a lot of revolution, like industrial revolution, agricultural revolution, and technological revolution. And as you can see, uh, the world population exploded and I'm a biologist, so I'm not very good at uh, the adding. 
So 7.8 billion people living in uh, living on Earth, and also people uh, keep a lot of livestock like uh, cows, bulls, chickens, dogs, and actually uh, the number can vary uh, depend on uh, how many livestock we include in this uh, calculation. So it seems that actually the number of human beings and the livestock that they keep take up 60, uh, 96 to 98% of the entire living things on Earth. So as I mentioned before, uh, this is unprecedented uh, phenomenon because as I mentioned before, uh, the human beings actually took uh, uh, less than 1% when they came into existence on Earth. But now, actually, uh, the human beings and the livestock that they keep takes uh, 96 to 98% of the entire uh, living things on Earth. So as I mentioned before, the viruses actually live on um, the animals and they are habit their habitats or kind of living and the animals are being harmed by any the, the human beings homo sapiens so for the past 10 years korean people suffered from avian flus on an early basis so it means that the human are not immune from those viruses which used to live on the animals only so as I mentioned before, there is a, a lot of other crisis going on in terms of biodiversity. And if we fail to take relevant actions, then the situation will get worse. That's inevitable. Since I am talking about biodiversity, I would like to make a few more comments. So whenever there is a report on any avian flu case, uh, Let's say there is a, a chicken farmer in a remote, uh, the rural uh, the county in Korea, and there is a avian flu report made by uh, that uh, chicken farmer. Then all the, the bunch of officials come and visit uh, that uh, the hen farm or chicken farm, and they just uh, put them uh, on earth, uh, digging a big hole. And they also say that the migratory birds actually uh, transmitted the avian flu, but I do not agree to that. The migratory birds actually do not uh, have uh, time or intention to transmit the specific uh, uh, virus, avian flu. And also, I highly doubt that the migratory birds cannot travel such far distance to come to Korea and transmit the specific avian flu disease. And I don't believe that we are seen enough to be affected by avian flu on an early basis. So the migratory birds travel as far as 30 kilometers to attack a specific chicken farm in Korea. So I believe that the avian flu was transmitted by cars and people. And also these days, the wild boars are killed and hunted in Korea. And actually, that ASF uh, was originated, uh, African swine fever uh, was originated in South Africa. And I wonder how it traveled such far distance and uh, transmitted uh, to uh, the peaks here in Korea. Uh, maybe they wanted to take a, a overseas travel and wanted to take a look at uh, what has happening uh, here in Korea and how the peaks are doing here in Korea. Do you think it makes sense? I believe uh, actually it, the airplanes and the automobiles and the people actually traveled to transmit specific uh, the African swine flu uh, to the places around the world. But we are killing uh, these wild boars because we blame them for transmitting the specific uh, swine and flu. We need to blame ourselves because the disease uh, is transmitted because the way we it, cultivate them, the way we farm them. So we just selected artificially uh, specific uh, the, uh, the animals or the livestock, which lack any uh, genetic diversity. And since they are genetically alike, 
uh, this, uh, when there is a specific disease occurring that they were transmitted uh, in a very fast way. And also, as you can see, uh, in uh, the factory farming system here in Korea, the transmission of a certain disease can uh, happen very fast. So the wild animals uh, shouldn't be blamed for the transmission of this disease. So what I can tell you is uh, that the natural order uh, actually is uh, uh, not uh, designed to spread this kind of disease in this fast way. So you may have a chance to read this specific book, uh, The Selfish Gene. The greatest biologist uh, since uh, the Darwin, uh, the William Hamilton actually wrote this book and he gave a very easy to understand explanation on, on the genetic aspect uh, of biology. He was very good at biology and also he was a very uh, a, a literacy loving person. And even though his uh, book is about science, but actually the expressions uh, that he made in his uh, book uh, were quite beautiful. And one of the phrases that I want to quote here is the nature of horse pure stance. We believe that the nature is all about pure things, but uh, Mr. Hamilton said that nature of our pure stance. The nature never loses itself to uh, the pure things. So uh, nature keeps evolving. But Homo sapiens, so people living in nature, continue to damage and erode the biodiversity. So we are going against the law of nature. So you also know that uh, the COVID-19 or coronavirus keeps uh, generating different variants. So we just heard about the variant Alpha, Beta, and uh, Delta. And also some people say that there will be variant Epsilon. Korea and Korean people were lucky in terms of uh, the current pandemic. And in the past, actually, it took 10 to 15 years to develop or invent a new vaccine. But actually, if, as for the COVID-19 or coronavirus, it took less than one and a half year to develop uh, vaccines, thanks to the bioscientists and the biologists. And thanks to their efforts, actually, the entire humankind uh, succeeded in and overcoming or fighting against COVID-19. This time we are lucky. But still, um, when the pandemic like COVID-19 happens, uh, it can take like 4 million or 5 million uh, lives uh, over the course of a spread. And as I mentioned before, the pandemic will uh, come back in a different uh, variant or a different way. So we need to come up with fundamental measures. Uh, we can think of a behavior vaccine and in addition to chemical vaccine. And also we can think of ecological vaccine. If we preserve and conserve nature as it is, then it will be our ecological vaccine or eco vaccine. Of course, we need to make investment in uh, the vaccine development, but still we shouldn't forget that there are more effective and uh, better vaccines such as behavioral vaccine and eco vaccines. We can uh, come up with a clear conclusion with regard to uh, the process of or the progress of uh, these uh, viruses, but still the best thing that we can do is to preserve and conserve nature as it is, and it will make us free from and the viruses and virus cause the pandemic. I wrote a book called Ecological Turn. We are talking about a linguistic turn or a cultural turn or a technological transformation or a turn or information, even information and transformation. But I believe that there's no use uh, of such turns if it is narrowed down to the matter of life and death. So we need to think about the relationship uh, or redefinition of the relationship between Homo sapiens and nature. Homo sapiens is a too much complement uh, made by uh, the mankind. Actually, the mankind, uh, the or entire human race, should be humble enough uh, 
and should uh, declare that they will live in harmony with other uh, living beings. So we should call ourselves uh, homo symbios rather than homo sapiens. It means that uh, the 40 minutes given to me is up already. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you, the Professor. Well, time flew so fast as I listened attentively to your lecture. You said that there is no earth uh, in which only human beings would be able to live. Um, and uh, you talked about the climate crisis uh, after the pandemic uh, and about uh, the biodiversity the depletion. The problem is being aggravated, and you talked about what preparation we need to do to, to ready ourselves for coexistence in the future. I'm very interested to he hear from our youth panel. The, I'd like to invite them to, to pose questions directly to, to the professor. Ms. han Hyun, would you like to, to pose a question to Professor Che? Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Han Su Yeon, and I was a participant of the Jongsun Forum to Youth Impact last year. We uh, need to, to respect and uphold um, the values in order to, to protect our ecosystem. Once the COVID-19 situation stabilizes, we must find ways to respond to ensure citizen safety. On that part, you talked about hand washing, social distancing, which you described on the behavior vaccine, and touching animals and plants um, only when necessary, which you described under the echo vaccine. And there are things that to be done by the age group and, and these uh, social different social segments. Uh, adults need to enhance uh, the awareness, uh, bring in a sense of responsibility to young children, help them, and social enterprises should take the lead in responding to climate change and uh, become ecocentric enterprises. Now, I'm curious what you think are the role of um, us, uh, the young people, who are new entrants in society, what should we do for behavior and uh, echo vaccines? It, it's an excellent question. Thank you. And uh, I'll be rather blunt in uh, giving you a response. I say this up front. You talked about uh, um, the adult's responsibility, senior adult's responsibility, our responsibility to teach. I don't think that's necessary. Our young people are doing well are doing well and splendidly already. They wear a mask when they play in the playground. And our children, they just would drop the mask when they have to drink the water and put it back on immediately. It's the adults we have the problem with the mask wearing and so on. So children need to teach the adults. Adults need to learn from the children. And um, I've been a very passionate advocate of um, a cause at our next presidential election. I'm hoping that we'll be able to change the constitution. So for the constitutional amendment, uh, I am the promoting uh, uh, um, the advocating the amendment uh, with uh, an activist group. At um, the, the, the lower class, the lower um, parliament uh, in France, uh, they uh, made a proposal to, so that the, the French constitution would include our pledge to fight against uh, the climate change. But uh, the upper class, upper uh, parliament in the, the French, uh, upper house in the, in the French political scene is uh, very conservative. And therefore, uh, I think uh, this uh, leads to our uh, situation in the um, sub paragraph three of article one, uh, we talked about uh, the power belong to the Korean people. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that on the third paragraph, we'll be able to include a clause which says that we, the Korean people, are fighting against the climate change and we bear the responsibility to hand down clean environment to, to our future generation. And I coined this uh, phrase and uh, I'm working with the advocate uh, advocate group uh, for a constitutional amendment because constitutional amendment requires a referendum which costs a lot of money and we have to do it together with the presidential election so it's going to be quite simple if we do it together a constitutional amendment together do it at the presidential election because we just need one more piece of paper on that ballot now, if uh, this clause is going to be included in our constitution things are going to be hugely different and um, I just wrote a column for newspaper a few days ago, 
Uh, Mr. The President uh, of the United States, uh, Joe Biden, has uh, done, right after he was uh, sworn in, to, uh, the first thing that he has done at the time is uh, to commit to returning uh, to the, the um, climate organizations uh, uh, because it, this is a really symbolic thing because the president, uh, the former president, has withdrawn uh, from this international organization, and uh, the, the new president has uh, sworn into office and has just made a pledge that this is the most the single most important thing as the U.S. president. But I just don't understand what the candidates of uh, the Korean presidential election are doing. I don't know which planet they are from because that they are just engaged in this useless debate. Rather than engaging in those meaningless debates, I believe that all those presidential candidates should take the new IPCC report as a textbook and they should take a test. That is why I said in my um, column, I said that uh, we should make all the US, uh, the presidential candidates uh, study uh, this uh, report, and we should uh, make them uh, to, uh, take a test uh, um, rather than just uh, um, bickering over the useless things. Uh, and I do believe uh, that before the presidential election in May, all the candidates need to come together to discuss on this important topic. And our advocacy group is consists of 30 members. And uh, we have a college student representative in the 30 member advocacy group. And uh, I, I felt the shivers. Uh, it, um, um, in the, um, going down my spine that because this college student representative said that uh, you're all about words uh, and we should to be uh, you should stop doing that uh, the, uh, and the student said that uh, this is the reality that we face uh, this is not just uh, mere words uh, and we won't um, sit idle and let things happen. Uh, uh, we will be closely monitoring the situation. So we uh, are uh, urging you, the adults, the senior adults, to take appropriate actions. Uh, and it really, uh, I felt shivers going down my spine. And I agree with you. Uh, the youth need to take actions. And for the senior adults, we pledge to other things. And uh, um, it, we don't often implement our the commitments into action. It comes with aging. So this is my wish, I, my, the wish I have for the youth. I'm hoping that young adults would take actions, would rise and uh, take actions collectively, would call for such actions to be taken. This is what you should do. I may be having to carry it away with my apologies. I end my statement. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, um, a very serious matter. He just said that uh, this must be included in the, the new constitution. We have another panel, panel participating here. Finland. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Chair, for your great presentation. Uh, I've been in Korea for uh, seven years, and I am a Finnish student, Sarah uh, Pelande. Uh, recently in Finland, there has been a um, nonviolent demonstration and campaign under the title of Extinction Rebellion. And we all know that uh, North European people are passionate about environment um, the issues, and also they take a lot of uh, actions. But to the best of my knowledge here in Korea, the environmental issues are being dealt at the national level or government level rather than individual level. I think the difference comes from the cultural differences. So I'd like to have your opinions and how we can solve environmental issues in a more effective way uh, in consideration of cultural differences. That's a very good question, but I don't believe uh, that such kind of difference in action comes from a cultural difference. As you may remember, there was a candlelight demonstration engaged by Korean people. We actually impeached a president through the candlelight demonstration. Such kind of thing couldn't happen in a country in Europe like Finland. So once the Korean people have the right, the public awareness with regard to the environment issue, then Korean people will be very quick at taking actions. There is a Western, um, the old saying, that the farthest distance is a distance between 
the brain and heart. So I've spent 15 years in, um, in the Western society and the observations that I made uh, when I lived in the US was that actually the Americans spent a lot of time in thinking and discussing uh, with one another. But um, since you lived here in Korea as the, uh, for seven years, you now understand that Koreans uh, actually uh, uh, tend to argue a lot with one another. But once a decision um, is made, then we are very quick at taking actions and implementing in that decision made. So we are very good at execution. So to the best of my knowledge, Korean people are not fully aware of the seriousness of uh, climate change and biodiversity issue. They believe that uh, such issues are someone else's issues, so they do not feel close to uh, those issues. But as I told you earlier, once Korean people have awareness of that issue, and once they have the specific idea in their mind, then they will actually take action in a very quick way. And I have 100% confidence in that. And I believe that the climate change and the biodiversity issue should be in the center of the discussion in the presidential or campaign for the upcoming presidential election. As we all know, Korean people are highly educated people. And also, if we continue to inform the general public here in Korea of the importance or the seriousness of the environmental issues, and without knowing ourselves, the people will start taking actions. So I believe that we are taking a step one after another toward such kind of a state. And that's why I'd like to kindly ask you to join uh, hands together and make efforts to achieve that. And our efforts will not go in vain. So sooner or later, there will be a huge change made in Korea. Thank you very much, Professor Che, for your kind answer. So we need to have a better sense of a crisis with regard to climate change. And also you said our future is not that dark or dim. As soon as we realize the seriousness of the issue, then we can take a quick actions. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation and answer, Professor Che. Thank you very much. I look forward to meeting uh, Professor Che and talking with him in person at next year's Chungsun Forum. I hope uh, the pandemic situation will uh, get uh, resolved as soon as possible. I hope you enjoyed uh, the special lecture delivered by Professor Che under the title of Ecological Turn for the Post-Pandemic Life. So I would like to ask you to take away the key message that Professor Che gave you and actually implement them in your daily lives. And after a short break, we'll get started with the plenary session. And also, we've prepared a lot of um, the events uh, for the online viewers. Please don't miss them out. And also, uh, the Jungsun uh, Forum 2021 presents its session contents as a single picture through visual thinking. Now, let us see how the special lecture that we just have had uh, uh, was represented in the visual thinking slide. Thank you very much. Despite uh, the short time given to this visual thinking, we've just got a uh, well represented uh, slide of visual thinking. And also, if you go and visit uh, the Instagram um, site, you can find that this visual thinking slide. We'll take a short break and we will come back to you with a plenary session.
네, 안녕하십니까. 다시 인사드리겠습니다. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am Park Sun Young once again. Now, so we would like to begin the, the plenary session for Jongsun Forum 2021. And we have just shown a video clip uh, to introduce our speakers. And uh, we are going to, to look at very uh, important issues of uh, carbon neutrality, the consumption, and uh, we invited uh, the dignitaries uh, from various uh, social, uh, the society, uh, various parts of the society to, to deliver a very important uh, speech. Some of us uh, would be joining us uh, online. And uh, now I'd like to invite the moderator, uh, Yu Yan Chol, and uh, the panels uh, to the uh, stage before we begin the, the plenary session. And allow me to introduce uh, the moderator. The, um, Honorable Liu Yuan Chal is here. He's a former ambassador of climate change for Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And Owen Jansen of the Director for External Affairs of the Cl Green Climate uh, Fund. Park Ho Jung, Professor of Food and Resources um, Economics in Korea University. Kim Han Senior Director of McDonald's Korea, Joshi Wexler, who joins us online, researcher, writer and editor of the Ethical to Consumer Research Association Limited, Maria Salome. Um, Secretary General of the WEEC Network and Andrew Simon uh, the, from the Northeast Asia the Correspondent Editor. Uh, so I ask you to exchange greetings. Um, and now we invite uh, the former Ambassador Yu Yun Chol to, to the begin the, the moderation. So the mic is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Yu Yun Chol. And uh, we... Uh, are now holding the Jung the Forum, the, despite the very difficult situation under the uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And uh, this is the first uh, plenary session to, of the two-day forum. It's an honor for me the moderator, to be the moderator of the plenary session. To, and uh, I was introduced as uh, the, the former the ambassador for climate change at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, I stepped down from the ambassadorial position after holding uh, the PPG summit uh, successfully in uh, June. And I pledge myself uh, to continue to make efforts uh, to contribute to the improving the climate change situation, even if I'm not the ambassador anymore. I participated in the Jongsun Forum last year as well. And uh, last year's Jongsun Forum and uh, this year's uh, forum have similarities and differences. First on the similarities, as you know well, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, continues. Uh, the difficulties remain. This is the common feature of the, the Jongsun Forums last year and this year. And the largest difference is that we see the changes being uh, uh, taking place in the Korean society. And I believe uh, that at the center of the change, uh, the 2050 carbon neutrality uh, is uh, there. And uh, through the, the, the speech, uh, the presidential speech, uh, there's been a pledge um, for a declaration to, to achieve a 20, uh, 2050 the carbon neutrality. And uh, many businesses came together for the ESG uh, business management uh, declaration. This is the first year for the ESG management declaration of the Korean businesses. These are huge changes, and I believe uh, that uh, this... Um, um, has to do with uh, the May, uh, the P4G summit uh, of 2021, which was held in Seoul. And uh, we came to, to come up with a clear target uh, because uh, as we uh, successfully held uh, the, the summit. And uh, for the Jong the Forum, I was very looking very much for the opening speech of uh, the uh, chairperson, Kang Gum I was greatly impressed with the handout that was given in the, the program book. Uh, and um, the main themes, the main message, uh, the life uh, um, of uh, this uh, life that we lead uh, in this uh, climate, uh, if, like our lives in sustainable environment, uh, will be uh, proclaimed and promoted throughout this uh, uh, forum. I very much look forward to the discussions. And uh, 
We are joined by outstanding uh, the, the panelists here today. Some of us uh, are not able to join us at this uh, stage, but uh, only through the online. And uh, Wu Yun's understand is uh, with uh, the uh, GCF uh, uh, located in the intern. He joins us uh, through the, uh, the online. Uh, and and uh, Park Ho Jung is a professor of food and resources economics at the Korea University. He joins us uh, live. And the third uh, presenter is Kim Han Il, uh, senior director of McDonald's at Korea. And um, those who join us online, um, the next speaker is uh, Josie Wexler. She is a researcher, writer, and editor of the Ethical the, uh, Consumer Research Association. And the next speaker is Maria Salome, and uh, Secretary General of the WEEC Network. And the last speaker to join us, uh, he was here with us last year as well. Again, we have uh, Mr. Andrew Salmon. Uh, he is uh, the Northeast Asia Correspondent Editor of Asia Times. So we thank you all for your time. And um, today, uh, we invite um, the panelists to talk about the international perspectives, international organizers' perspectives on carbon neutrality. And uh, Mr. Oh Yoon, uh, Ms., excuse me, uh, Sanja Suren is going to talk about uh, this topic first. And then uh, we will hear about the Korean perspectives uh, from uh, the Korean uh, speaker's side. So, uh, um, Ms. Oh Yoon, um, the mic is yours. Thank you, Ambassador. And thank you to all the organizers very much for inviting the Green Climate Fund, which is Jinson Forum. It's a, uh, indeed a great privilege. First of all, I would like to congratulate Korea for, first of all, domestically, bravely embracing the carbon neutrality goal by, and the net zero pledge by 2050. This is very important in the region, but also globally. And also uh, Korea's leadership globally for to supporting developing countries in its transition to low carbon development. And uh, Korea both hosting the Green Climate Fund here in Korea and Songdo, and also financially contributing to GCF. It supports the leapfrogging of developing countries to greener development in more than 140 countries in the world by contributing to GCF. So they're very grateful to Korea for leadership both domestically and globally as well. The climate crisis is the biggest threat to humanity and that's why the leadership of all the countries including Korea is very important and the leadership to, to tackle the climate crisis. I think just a few days ago we've heard from the news that unfortunately again uh, the um, July 2021 was the Earth's hottest month on record, and indeed the past decade was also hottest on record. We did see a short-term decline in uh, carbon dioxide emissions from coronavirus lockdowns last year in 2020, but this will have a very negligible effect on the buildup of greenhouse gases concentrations in the atmosphere. We also have seen, um, again, uh, not only last month, but also this month, a lot of natural disasters, droughts, but also fires, unfortunately, and they've been all exacerbated by the climate change. Some of you may have um, seen the recent IPCC report, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they show that the global temperature never exceeded the pre-industrial value by more than 2%, sorry, 2 degrees Celsius over the past 3 million years. And that's actually the time where um, our, the human species um, have been uh, living in more or less in a balanced ecosystem. And based on the existing trends, we could cross the two degrees Celsius threshold at the beginning of the second half of the century, of this century. But then um, the, currently we already reached 1.1 degrees Celsius, and we may reach 1.5 degrees Celsius already during 2030 and 20. 30s and 2040s, which is um, the climate change, as uh, Secretary General of the United Nations said that climate change is actually running faster than we are running faster than our solutions and action. And that's why I think it's very, very important 
that the net zero pledges and net zero race is taking up the momentum recently. You may have, you, you probably know about the Paris Agreement, of course, and um, the limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius over the course of the century requires steep reductions. And in the next 10, in the next decade, we have to halve the emissions. And the decade after, we have to halve again as well. But unfortunately, if you look at the Paris Agreement, what we call nationally determined contributions of pledges and promises of various countries, if you, we all add those pledges up, then the projected results will translate into increase of temperature somewhere between 2.9 and 3.4 degrees Celsius. Basically, even with the actions from countries that pledged for Paris Agreement, uh, it's not enough, so we need to do even more. So these are very enormous tasks. Um, and those risks are being um, acknowledged. And um, if you look at the World Economic Forum top risks report, compared to maybe just even 10 or even less than 10 years ago, where the key risks would be um, more sort of economy, income, uh, the traditional you know, uh, security risks and financial risks. More recently, in the last five years, the extreme weather conditions, failure to act on climate change, human-made environmental damage, but also biodiversity loss are becoming the key risks to the, not only the um, globe, but also to uh, the, 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 also the, the right growth around the world. Just to remind you which industries are the largest emitters, you see electricity, agriculture, manufacturing, transportation, buildings, food waste, and of course there should be a major transformation, major change in those industries. Just want to remind you which countries are the largest emitters, and you have around top 20 emitters that contribute to approximately, again, 80% of the total global emissions. And so it's very important that the top emitters also undertake the major transformations in their uh, economies and societies as well. The, I know that there was a lot of discussions about the um, sustainable consumption, but also sustainable growth. And um, we all know that the consumption in the last decades was very unsustainable uh, compared just maybe a few thousand years ago. Of course, population have grown 10 times, and meanwhile, per capita consumption also grown 10 times. So in effect, the other mo our Mother Earth has to sustain 100 times more of a consumption from human species compared to several thousand of years ago. So it's becoming very unsustainable. And if you look at this graph, it's a bit slightly outdated, but compared to 2007, 2008, the middle class around the world is tripling. Uh, of course, GDP is growing, and then majority of the population is now going to live in the cities. And it's not just a simple population growth, it's a growth in the consumption of each individual as well. So, um, if you look, uh, this is a, a slide from um, uh, presented during the two years ago during the COP by uh, Professor Nick Stern from London, from the UK. And then, if you look uh, in the next 15 years or so, of course, you know, we expect again infrastructure investments double, GDP also double in the next 20 years. And uh, as I mentioned, the urban population is going to live at least 70% in, in urban areas. And at the same time, with all this growth, we need to decrease um, GHG emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, if we want to reach 1.5 degrees, halving, halving, and then reaching net zero by 2050. Um, so it's been a very challenging situation. At the same time, however, I think there is a new momentum that is being built around the race on achieving net zero, and the innovation can break those challenging trends uh, since the last, um, yeah, basically since the last 12, over the last 12 months, 
um, more than 120 countries pledge net zero. They represent about 65% of global emissions, represent more than 70% of the world economy. And as I mentioned, Korea is actually leading in this um, uh, pledge to, for the carbon neutrality. And this political momentum is actually very, very important. And then that, that has to translate. And of course, in our region here in Asia Pacific, China, uh, Japan, uh, Republic of Korea, but also, of course, United States, and uh, one of the largest emitters and European countries. So if you add all those countries, it's about 65% of uh, total emissions. Of course, there is, um, we're definitely seeing more public support growing, especially from the new generation. However, all those pledges must now be translated into roadmaps to reach this net zero, and then it's to be translated into concrete actions. And then, uh, and then also finance is very key. And that's where Green Climate Fund, where we work, comes. Green Climate Fund is a fund, and then we, um, the, we provide funding for this net zero, for the um, green growth, low carbon development in developing countries. I would like to explain to you how Green Climate Fund uh, actually delivers on this transformative approach. We invest across four transitions, and that's um, um, build environment, energy, industry, human security and well-being, land use, forests and ecosystems. We invest not only into projects, we also invest into transformation planning and programming. We also invest in trying to catalyze climate innovation, not only through technology, but through new financial uh, systems and instruments. And we try to do risk investments, working with private sector, investing in blended instruments as well. And then, of course, it's very important to change the financial system in countries to be aligned with Paris Agreement, but also with the, the uh, sustainable development goals. Increasing finance is important, but of course, not just increasing finance is not enough. Innovation is also key. It's innovation in policies and in institutions, capacities, technology, and as I said, financial innovations. When we mention financial innovations, we mean that it's not just giving money or loans or grants in the developing countries to invest in green development. It's also uh, de-risking private capital investment so that the bespoke solutions will help both private sector and public sector actually to leapfrog to greener, the, um, to greener projects. So you see that our instruments that GCFS uses are loans, equity, guarantees, not only simple grants. Um, I will stop here because I think my time is over, but then uh, I think over the question and answer time, I'll try to explain some of the projects that we invest in. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Uh, you talked about uh, the global the crisis uh, created by the coronavirus and the economic crisis. Uh, in order to overcome these crises, uh, we need to, to go through uh, massive changes. We need a transformational approach. Uh, we need a um, convergence in the way that we approach things. Uh, we thank you very much for your comment. And uh, now I'd like to talk about, uh, invite the Korean speaker to, uh, to talk about the Korean response. Uh, Professor Park, would you like to um, begin? To, I'll give you 10 minutes and I will give you three minutes uh, for discussions afterwards. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I uh, am given uh, 10 minutes for my presentation and I will uh, actually brief on the conclusion of my presentation just in case I do not have enough time to go through all of the slides that I uh, prepared for today's presentation. We all know that climate change uh, is a real thing and we cannot actually avoid uh, the side effects or uh, the negative impact of the climate change. It seems uh, that a lot of Korean companies uh, struggle uh, to cope with or deal with uh, climate change and also uh, on the side of consumers there should be certain change made in terms of their awareness and the recognition so i believe that not only in the production side but also in consumption side we need to actually make a change 
Uh, the previous uh, speaker, uh, the director, Oh Yun, uh, just uh, explained how uh, dire the situation is uh, uh, with regard to climate change. But I want to make a few more comments with regard to the climate change from the perspective of, of economists. The biggest concern that I have uh, is uh, the climate change, particularly the extreme, uh, the change range. So here you can see the confidence interval, which is over uh, three degrees Celsius. So if uh, the Earth is heated up uh, for more than uh, four degrees Celsius, then the Earth will look uh, totally different from um, um, the one as we know it. So this is uh, the right time for us to take an imminent action uh, to avoid this, this such a uh, situation. And the next term that I want to brief you on is a climate departure. A climate departure can happen uh, uh, more often than not. So um, around the year 2040, uh, the climate de departure can happen. So despite the seriousness of the climate uh, change issue, uh, it seems uh, that we fail to recognize uh, uh, its seriousness uh, because of uh, this uh, the, the discount uh, issue or discount phenomenon. This discount phenomenon is uh, that we uh, tend to underestimate uh, the seriousness of uh, the issue when we feel it uh, distant, not close enough to our daily lives. So many people answer that uh, they take climate change seriously. However, when they are asked how much they can uh, pay uh, to reduce the GHEG emission, it seems that there is a very uh, high resistance in terms of the consumer's sentiment. So even though they say they recognize the seriousness of uh, the environmental issue and the climate change, but they are not willing to pay more uh, to cut down uh, the greenhouse gas emission. And um, uh, I just uh, actually add this slide for it. Then, um, a few decades ago, there was a, a nationwide campaign uh, to reduce the number of teenage uh, smokers. And at the time, the sacrifice now and the you will live longer uh, was used as a kind of campaign uh, catchphrase or a campaign slogan. But actually, that uh, slogan or catchphrase didn't work because uh, the teenagers uh, thought uh, that living longer is uh, too far distance for them. So they just changed uh, the campaign strategy. And also, uh, we actually need to learn from um, this failure case of anti-smoking campaign for teenagers uh, of the US. So we need to actually enable people to realize how serious the climate change issue is and how imminent the uh, crisis is. I conducted a study on herd immunity of COVID-19 in South Korea, and I released this paper. And before uh, the advent of the variants of COVID-19 virus, people believe uh, that when 60, uh, when uh, 60 to 90, 70 percent of the entire population is inoculated with vaccines, then we can create a herd immunity. But with the introduction or the occurrence of new variants, actually, it seems uh, not feasible. Now, I'd like to talk about economics. So when an economic decision is made, we need to uh, think about uh, the climate aspect as well. This is a very delicate issue. Uh, recently, the National the Carbon Neutrality Committee of uh, Korea uh, came up with uh, this specific uh, principle, intergenerational equity principle. Uh, it says that we need to avoid putting a greater re um, the reduction burden on future generations by delaying uh, the reduction period. And we need to guarantee the future generations right to, uh, right to live and self-determination. We actually need to accumulate capital to cope with this uh, uh, dire uh, the climate change issue. And we actually need to guarantee the future generation's uh, uh, right to live as well as uh, their right to live through economic capabilities. 
So the U.S. came up uh, with uh, this uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction targets uh, since 2005, and also uh, just uh, on, on the track of the actual uh, the emission reduction. And if you just uh, predict uh, its future path, it seems that the U.S. will succeed in achieving its net zero uh, goal um, as uh, planned. But uh, in the case of Korea, we need to uh, take drastic measures to achieve a net zero a 2050 goal. And I highly doubt whether the current path uh, will be plausible or the feasible enough to achieve the 2050 net zero goal. Uh, 500 gigawatt solar power plant uh, should be introduced and also the wind turbine a power plant should uh, be introduced to accommodate uh, 200 uh, mega gigawatt uh, uh, power generation so currently we have only 20 gigawatt uh, capacity of a renewable energy source uh, the power but actually we need to increase it to uh, 700 million megawatt we are talking about a 2040 net zero goal or 2050 net zero goal. And by the time we reach 2040 or 2050, we will have much more advanced technology with regard to greenhouse gas emission. And in the case of US, they, I mean, it has, the country has large land, so it can actually bury certain waste and also they can dig up the land to build a renewable energy source based power plants but the case in Korea is totally different and when it comes to the capital stock Korea looks far behind compared to the countries which declared the carbon neutrality goals Many people say uh, that Korea is a advanced country, but still uh, it needs to accumulate uh, the enough capital to achieve its carbon neutrality uh, target. As the director Oyun rightly pointed out, Korea needs to establish the third uh, wave of uh, growth uh, capital that could be a green uh, capital. So we need to uh, actually utilize the ETS system to accumulate such kind of fund or capital. If you take a look at this slide, uh, the, the upper part is the utility bill of Korea, and the lower part is the ETS price uh, here in Korea, in the Korea market. So in order to raise the ETS price, uh, the retail uh, power price should or needs to go up. This is the case of uh, Germany. The, the blue line stands for the retail power price and the red line stands for the ETS price. And as you can see, these two lines are aligned. But um, in the case of Korea, as I mentioned before, these two prices are not aligned because uh, the Korean government actually controls uh, uh, the price of power or the electricity price in an artificial uh, way. And I'd like to talk about how this system is linked to uh, the global uh, the ETS system and uh, Director Oyun and uh, the, the rightly point out that the innovation would be the key uh, to the solution of climate change issue. I believe that the smart grid technology was introduced to Korea, but it failed because of price regulation. So in this progressive power uh, building system here in Korea. Uh, there's no uh, uh, motive for consumers to cut down uh, their uh, power consumption. Uh, it seems that I used uh, uh, the 10 minutes given to my presentation. And if you have uh, further questions about my presentation, please use the Q&A session. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Paul, you just mentioned that uh, the carbon price uh, should be realized by being reflected on product price. And also you just mentioned the need to uh, the align need for alignment between the ETS price and the power price. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Paul, for giving us a Korean perspective in terms of ETS uh, and, and the power price.
또 생산자와 이제 소비자. And now I think it's time that we view the perspectives of the producers and consumers. Now we invite uh, Mr. Kim Han Il, Senior Director of Supply Chain at McDonald's Korea. Please share with with us uh, the, the corporate perspective. And uh, uh, George Wexler, so we'd like to invite you afterwards to, to talk about the consumers. Good afternoon. Um, I am Kim Han I'm the Senior uh, Director of Supply Chain at McDonald's Korea. Uh, I am pleased to represent McDonald's Korea at Jongsan the Forum today to share the company's ESG activities related to climate change and environmental protection. Under the slogan, the small but great changes for the better community, we are striving to contribute to developing regional community and protecting the environment by managing and supplying sustainable food ingredients, reducing plastic use, converting to eco-friendly materials, and converting to high-efficiency eco-friendly energy to reduce carbon emissions. McDonald's Korea is taking concrete actions and making pledges to protect the environment. In addition, we are taking the lead in helping regional communities by engaging directly with them. We've also hired 15,000 persons through open discrimination-free recruitment system, actively hiring the youth and the people with disabilities in Korea. We also take actions for environmental protection and carbon reduction. They include, include sustainable raw material supply, water quality protection, forest preservation, development and recycling of eco-friendly packages, and the reusing of uh, renewable energy. I'll explain the details later. First of all, on supply of sustainable raw materials, uh, they include the use of 100% rainforest oil certified beans and uh, the introduction of the 100% uh, sunflower oil. The certification of the Tropical Rainforest Alliance is given only to the beans raised by workers who have been guaranteed a stable life on farms that, that practice eco-friendly farming methods. The improvement of human rights um, coffee farmers um, have been made, and uh, they also contribute to the preservation of rainforests. Also, McDonald's Korea is the first in the Korean QSR industry to replace all the frying oils used in stores from palm oil to sunflower oil since October last year. Compared with other vegetable oils, sunflower oil is an eco-friendly food ingredient with low saturated fatty acids and trans fats. They use um, By using sunflower oil, the result we eat, um, have also to, um, contributed to the less rainforest destruction and uh, less greenhouse gas emissions. And also we are at the uh, forefront of uh, providing delicious and healthy menu and protecting the environment. Also, McDonald's Korea uses eco-friendly agricultural fisheries products certified by GAP um, and uh, MSC as food ingredients. Uh, GAP certification is only given when the, in the production, harvesting and management agriculture products, farmers reduce um, the use of pesticides and chemical fertilizers and maintain soil fertile by using uh, green manure crops. MSC certification is given. My apologies. Uh, MSC certification is given when marine ecosystems such as species and habitats are protected in a sound manner and the fishermen are engaged in sustainable the fishing activities. Uh, this is an international certification that assesses uh, such various factors. Next, let's talk about McDonald's and Korea's efforts to improve package and recycling activities. First, we plan to convert the packaging materials used in all McDonald's stores to recyclable, reusable, or eco-friendly packaging by 2025. As of 2021, 84% of all packaging materials used in our stores across the countries have been converted to paper packaging that has been certified as environmentally friendly by DFSC. FSC certification is an eco-friendly certification given to paper produced in a sustainable manner, such as maintaining biodiversity forest. Also, for the first time in the domestic QSR industry, we've developed a beverage lid called Tukongi that does not need a straw since October last year. We've introduced it to stores nationwide through various plastic reduction activities, such as introduction of this lid. 
we will be reducing the amount of plastics used by 30% or 530 tons this year. Next, I'll briefly to introduce the package improvement and recycling project that McDonald's Korea is carrying out this year. In the first quarter, we removed the pea film coating in the French fried uh, products carton, uh, we removed uh, straw canisters in the store, and we changed the logo printing of PET cup into embossing type to enable recycling of the PET cups. In the second quarter, we reduced the size of the plastic spoon and carried out the coffee um, gourd, uh, the uh, coffee barks excuse me, recycling projects. Uh, in uh, quarter three, we will introduce a sealing machine to the store and replace uh, the pea cup and the paper cup plastic lids uh, used uh, for delivery with the film. I will discuss other recycling projects in the more detail in the, my next few slides. The next three slides, I uh, will uh, briefly show how coffee barks, PET cups, and paper cups are recycled. Coffee barks are used uh, as fertilizers or interior materials uh, through a recycling process. Paper cups will be recycled into napkins or toilet paper, while the PET cups uh, will be recycled into eco-friendly goods or uniforms uh, through recycling process. In addition to the carbon reduction activities that we've been doing in the supply chain, we'd like to introduce some more carbon reduction activities that we have been implementing in stores. First, 95% of the bikes used in all our stores have been converted to electric bicycles, and they will be converted 100% by the end of this year. Secondly, eco-friendly, high-efficient LED lights are installed in 70% of our stores nationwide, and five stores installed solar panels to take the lead in converting to eco-friendly energy. The most recently opened Goyang Samsung DT is an eco-friendly flagship restaurant that reflects many eco-friendly projects that McDonald's Korea is working on. All new open stores will be built as eco-friendly flagship restaurants in the future. Lastly, I'd like to wrap up with the McDonald's Korea's 2025 eco-friendly packaging plan. First, we promise to source 100% of our primary guest packaging from the renewable re to into renewable recycled or the certified sources. Secondly, we will eliminate problematic plastics while increasing recycled and renewed content in remaining plastic items. Third, we'll drastically reduce the plastics and offer sustainable Happy Meal toys globally. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, thank you, Mr. Kim. We were able to hear about um, McDonald Korea's contributions as an exemplar company in implementing the ESG, to, uh, and this will help us uh, achieve uh, the 2050 carbon neutrality uh, strategy. Uh, this has to do with the reduced use of the plastics and uh, better use of the PT cups and so on. Now we'd like to uh, listen to, to the consumer perspective, what we can do as consumers. Mr. Lee. Let me invite Ms. Josh Wexler. Um, I'm going to speak uh, about uh, really using the UK as an example because it's what I know, but it's a lot of this will be relevant elsewhere. Um, so in the UK, we also have a commitment to reach net zero by 2050. And um, as a result, uh, a statutory body called the Committee on Climate Change uh, was established to advise the government on how we were going to achieve that. Um, and that body has created scenarios on how we can decarbonize the UK. Um, and so I'm going to refer to some of their scenarios and just talk a bit about the details of how we might do this and what the consumer's role will be in it. Um, this, uh, uh, the, uh, about 41, the, the Committee on Climate Change has calculated that about 41% they think can be done with just technology, but most of the rest will involve some change from people and consumers will have to play an important role. Um, and so 
uh, about 16% just consumers. Uh, so it is the consumers are going to have to change the way they think about things if we're going to achieve this. In the UK, we're quite lucky in that consumers are quite aware of the issues um, and all the evidence suggests they do want to act, or some of them do, however, they are often confused about what they ought to be doing. So, um, so I'm just going to go through some details of different uh, sectors. Um, hang on. So just talking about food. Um, uh, so the Committee on Climate Change's uh, scenarios on this suggest that both consumers and producers are going to have to change what they're doing. Um, they both have significant control over what happens. Um, uh, the role of consumers here is really about the fact that there's uh, a, the, a huge way to reduce emissions is the production of uh, consumption in ruminant animal meat, so cows and sheep and goats. Um, this is, uh, there's a calculation from um, uh, a paper, a academic paper in the UK that suggests that by cutting uh, uh, your meat consumption by changing from a medium meat, meat eater to no meat at all, no animal products at all, you can basically cut your carbon emissions in half of your diet. Um, you can also, um, production, uh, changes to production methods will make huge difference as well. Um, so in the scenario that is being put forward to our government, there is a 20 to 50 percent reduction in the consumption of beef, lamb and dairy products by 2050. And that frees up a lot of agricultural land uh, through that and more efficient farming uh, to use for energy crops and to forest. So how are consumers feeling about this is the UK public is still doesn't understand this link that well. Only about half currently link agriculture with climate change at all. So they don't really quite understand. Um, however, when it's explained, quite a significant number say that they, will, they would consider reducing their consumption of meat and dairy. Um, uh, about 40% uh, about say they would consider a, 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 a quarter reducing their meat consumption by a quarter. And uh, about 29% say they would reduce, consider reducing their consumption of dairy products. So, uh, and we have had a reduction recently in, in consumption of meat and dairy in the UK. Um, uh, so, uh, so it looks like the public don't understand, but when they do, they are up for making some changes. That's quite positive. Um, I'm just going to go on to another sector, just manufactured goods. Um, uh, I'll just use clothing as an example. Again, the consumers and the producers do have control, both ha have control here. Producers have more control, really, in this instance. Um, uh, the, the World Economic Forum did an analysis of how you could decarbonize the clothing sector, um, and uh, most of it is from uh, changes to uh, uh, from the use of coal uh, in uh, electricity to renewable electricity, uh, changes to the uh, use of renewable heat, um, and changing production processes from wet to dry production processes, also making changes to efficiency. So this it's largely a, a production changes. However, there is also a huge uh, secondhand potential in in certainly in the UK. Three quarters of clothing that's thrown away is in good condition, and only about 10% is resold. So we have a huge potential here for just reusing clothing. Um, so that's something that uh, UK consumers should be uh, sh uh, need to uh, uh, get on board with. UK consumers are aware of this, but they're again they're a bit confused about the whole the whole issue. Um, Hopefully, if when they, they are less confused, they will change what they're doing. Um, heating in the UK is a huge thing because we're a cold country. Um, uh, it, again, here, this, in this instance, consumers are, have a huge role to play. In the Committee on Climate Change's scenario, 
we cut heat demand by about 12% uh, through insulation and through behavioural changes, such as turning uh, heat, uh, heating off when you're out. Um, and then we have to change how we do heating because in the UK we largely heat with gas and that has to change to electricity and probably electric heat pumps or to hydrogen. Um, the UK consumers are extremely ignorant about this. Only about half of the UK realise that heating is a source of greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a huge thing that we need to address through education. And then transport, um, which uh, here again, this is both a consumer issue and a producer issue. Um, uh, and consumers, uh, the way, ways to address this would be production, changes in uh, 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 transport method mode, um, efficiency gains, and but the biggest one really is the shift to electric transport. And in the Committee on Climate Change scenario, there is very little reduction really. This is all about uh, um, electricity, uh, which vehicles are electrified by 2030. There is some efficiency gains, and um, there are also uh, where electricity can't be used, there are other fuels like ammonia. Um, UK consumers do realise the link uh, between transport and climate. So uh, this is a matter of taking action. Um, so consumers basically need, in the UK, they need education because they're very misinformed about what are the sources of greenhouse gas emissions. And they need to be offered lower carbon options because a lot of the time, for example, they don't um, have uh, the option to buy uh, low, uh, low carbon um, vehicles or they, they also for redu reductions of meat, they need to be offered lower carbon uh, uh, options in restaurants. In some cases, they will need financial help because, for example, in the heating sphere, a uh, heat pump is extremely expensive. Consumers are probably not going to make that investment on their own. And in some cases, they will need uh, dramatic changes in infrastructure. Um, for example, electric vehicles will need charging points if they're going to be rolled out across the population, which is going to happen very soon. Uh, okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Yeah, 발표 감사합니다. 우리 탄소 중립을 위한 소비자의 시각에 대해서 발표를 해 주셨는데요. 탄소 중 탄소를 배출 감축을 위해서는 소비자의 행동이 변화가 필요한데. 예를 들면 육류 소비, 육류 소비, 육류의 섭취를 우리가 그 줄인다든지 의류 소비가 너무 낭비적이다. 그래서 이를 하기 위해서는 어 여러 가지 소비자의 니드 교육이 필요하고 여러 가지 점을 말씀해 주셨습니다. 그러면 이제 공급자 그다음에 소비자 발표를 들었으니까 이러한 것들을 전체적으로 실천을 하려면 어떻게 할 것인가에 대해서 또 발표를 해 주시겠습니다. 우리 마리오 살로몬의 우리 사무총장님께서 환경 교육의 중요성에 대해서 또 발표를 해 주시겠습니다. 고 다스테르논 마이 워드 이즈 이즈 올 땡큐 베리 마치 포 요 인비테이션. 웰, 에듀케이션. 에더 크루셜 퀘스티언 is uh, the education uh, responsible for human greed? Is uh, education responsible for the pillage and plundering uh, of the planet resources or uh, on uh, over today celebrated uh, this year on July 29th uh, and in developing countries uh, much earlier, like between February and May? I do not think so. As you can notice, 
there are most developing countries on the right side of the screen. The problem is the problem of life studies. The world is divided into parts. Certainly, however, education, especially uh, starting from Europe uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, was an instrument uh, of humanity's uh, long march toward the Anthropocene, and then during the Anthropocene was the prop for the great acceleration of each indicator. The foundation on which the education system had been born, beginning with the 19th century in Europe, have formed the minds already to upset the denomination of humankind, of nature, as well as a series of injustices and inequalities. The more knowledge grows in recent centuries, the more social and environmental problems grow together. In the century, for example, the extermination of Jews, minorities, and the political openness by the Nazi regime was allowed by a well-oiled organization apparatus designed and managed by educated graduate people or citizen of a nation mother or a great philosopher, a scientist, a musician, writers. Even the greater blunder of biodiversity and the terrible climate catastrophe that looms over the world of fire and upset by the pandemic and did is also fruit of all mistakes, are the product of the incredible power of transformation, destruction, put in the endless of humankind by a multitude of educated people, great scientists, excellent technicians, cultural and prepared managers, politicians, who grew up in the schools and the universities. Indeed, the, the educational system have fragmented knowledge into an infinite number of disciplines. Well, we, we need a holistic approach and a transformative learning. They have closed the young people in, in the four walls of their classroom, drawing the world different from the earlier world. The carbon economy was built in the Anthropocene on these foundations. And as the great Indian writer Amit Bosch denounces in the great derangement, artists and writers have also been the complexes. The art of these times will be one day remembered not for their daring, nor for their championing of freedom, but the right because of their complicity in the great derangement. It is a question. He suspects that the rage of artists and writers and the features of order could be from the perspective of the Anthropocene, a form of collusion. Indeed, the Gosh says uh, the climate change should be the principal preoccupation of writers, and this is far from being the case. It is important for education because artists and writers are those who want young people study on the benches uh, or whom they teach in school and university classroom. Education system uh, form the masses uh, uh, for a society of mass production and consumption. We have had an explosion of data and media. Uh, still, these masses uh, are uh, ready to crowd the shopping malls uh, as battlefields uh, or divide themselves uh, in the fights with uh, uh, other uh, bases that only produce a medium. The research has privileged the field capable of giving domination and profit, trying to adapt the finite planet to infinite craving. Uh, for the few able to take advantage with, vice versa, we have neglected the fields of research that could ensure us to improve the knowledge of life on the planet and how to live sustainably on the climate. The planet has neglected the need of earth ethics. 
there were many ambitious human beings, unscrupulous social climbers, diverse uh, people in search of the users, uh, while we would need the peacemakers, leaders, uh, prevailers, uh, dreamers, authoritarians, uh, and friends. Uh, or while we need to build a planetary community of destiny, and this is the main challenge for education. When the Anthropocene arrived, the governance built the educational system based on the series of principles, or as my friend David Orr calls them, Paul Paul's myth. David Orr chooses six. Among these, I would be like uh, uh, mention, to mention that knowledge uh, and the technology allow us to manage their system, that it is possible to restore what we are destroyed. To quote David Dorr again, the crisis cannot be solved by the same kind of education that helped create the problem. We must work for the transition to education. We must be aware that we, as humankind, are or should be in transition. We are or must be transitioning from a permanent civil war, a war among human beings, a war between human beings or part of human beings and the life cycles of a finite planet where everything is that connected, the war and ecological civilization. It is, it must be a transition civilization. Previous transition happened in the past, from the Paleolithic to Neolithic, with this revolution in agriculture and livestock, uh, from rural civilization to industrial civilizations, uh, with the industrial revolution, imperialism, and colonialism, that is from Holocene to the Anthropocene. The transition from a paradigm of human exceptionalism or exceptionalism to an, an ecological paradigm is mandatory. On pain of huge catastrophes that we can no longer define as unimaginable, but which are perfectly imaginable. Described in the scenarios of the IPCC, X report a few days ago, is terrible, and in reports of many research centers. The apocalyptic future is no longer born from the imagination of science fiction uh, authors, but is written in the previous algorithm of mathematical models. In short, dear friends, we also need the transition to a new education. This new education is inevitably environmental. It is environmental because it has at the center the relationship and mutual influence between the prolific invasive and intrusive species, the human species, and nature, a nature to which the humankind belongs and on which it depends with its complex interweaving of biotic and abiotic factors. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you very much. Uh, by reflecting on the, the past practices in education, uh, we could seek a transformation into a new uh, environment uh, based on the, um, the ecology, the ecological concepts. And now to, uh, I'd like to, to invite the panel who represents the media. Uh, he joined us um, at the Chongsung Forum last year as well. Uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Andrew Salmon to, to give us uh, the, the journalist perspective on this very important topic. The mic is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm deeply embarrassed to be sitting here. I can claim absolutely no expertise uh, in this topic uh, compared to everyone who's spoken before. I'm, I'm at sort of pre-kindergarten level. So instead of talking about the issue at hand, let me talk about a rather wider issue. Uh, which is the issue which has been touched on in some of the earlier presentations on how we change human behavior, how we change corporate behavior, and how we innovate and bring new technologies uh, out of the pipeline and into practice. And let me illustrate this with some examples from here 
uh, in Korea. Uh, by the way, uh, by, uh, my presentation is Let's Go Green. I'm using a, a red uh, color scheme because it seems very clear to me that the world is not going green uh, at the rate at which it should. Uh -huh, right. Uh, I think if you open pretty much any media these days, somewhere in that media, you will find yourself bombarded with information about climate change and carbon neutrality and green growth and so forth. And this is hugely problematic because there's almost too much information out there and most of this information is agenda based. And if we are going to make changes in human behavior, we know from every sphere of activity the best way to make change is to make slow, gradual change, not sharp and sudden change. We should gently and slowly change the course of the oil tanker. I mean, we know this most particularly from, from dieting. Anybody who starts a crash diet or a crash exercise program, a sudden change will almost certainly fail. But if you take a gradualist approach, you have a much better chance of succeeding. So this raises the question, um, you know, of who we believe. Uh, so many people have so many different agendas. Not all the science is aligned. Some of the reports put out by business will contravene the reports put out by activists. So you've got to be very, very careful um, who you believe in this. And the problem we're seeing in what I would consider the great crisis of our time is a lack of leadership. The great crisis we are living through today is why we're wearing these masks is COVID. And COVID, the global response has been extremely uneven and many of the moving parts are banging into each other because there's no overall leadership which is accountable and empowered. If Joe Biden or Xi Jinping has got a problem or a solution, who do they pick up the telephone to and call? There's no one, there's no body. Even the COVAX facility is splintered in its responsibilities between WHO, UNICEF, CEFI, and Gavi. Um, so the lack of leadership in global society in dealing with global crises is hugely problematic. So let me give you an example from Korea, which unlike most countries, is very, very good at embracing sudden change rather than gradual change. The guy on the left, every Korean in the audience would know, is Park Chung-hee. And as you can see, he's not a cute, cuddly environmentalist. This is the man who seized power in a coup d'etat with this cabal of rather tough-looking guys and transformed Korea. Uh, and he did it in many ways very brutally. He wasn't a Democrat, but he got things done. If you look outside the windows of this venue, you'll see green mountains. And that's because this warrior was also an eco-warrior. He was the guy who reforested Korea, but he also built up Korea's infrastructure and its industry. He's the man who made Korea a prosperous, modernized nation for better and arguably also for worse. But why his importance is he understood how to create and manage change. So first he offered a vision. He told Koreans, if you work hard, you and your children will enter the sunlit uplands. And for businesses, he offered two, two approaches. He motivated them first by coercion. He used the stick. If you don't do what we tell you, you're gonna lose projects, you're not gonna get financing, you may go bankrupt, and you may go to jail. That's powerful motivation. But he also used the carrot, the reward strategy. If you do what we do, uh, if you do what we tell you to do, if you do it well, you can make a lot of money for yourself, your family, and your company. So it was a carrot and a stick approach, and this is how we motivate humans. So why then has the world failed to implement so many holy grail technologies in this space. Why has the petrochemical industry not come up with a biodegradable plastic? This is not science fiction. 
It is within the realms of possibility that we are choking our oceans and our landfill with this crap because the industry has not responded. Why not? Ditto fourth generation nuclear. This project started in 2020, uh, sorry, 20 years ago this year and still has not come to fruition. Many experts will say this is the future of energy generation. It's clean and it's safe. Where is it? Why is it not being executed? And why are so many people in the field so knee-jerk anti-nuclear? And what about storage technology for renewables? Renewables are now coming online, but industry can't use it because power oscillates. We need better storage technology. We need better ba battery technology. Uh, where is this technology? This needs to be accelerated uh, through every means possible. And this again comes to back to South Korea today. I, I hear so much from government officials in my daily business about we're going to do electric cars and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and so on. But they don't answer the key question. Hydrogen and electricity require energy generation. Where is that generation going to come from? Let's talk about downstream, but we also have to talk about upstream. That's a key question for the next president. And uh, I won't go into this. This has been covered by my colleague, Dr. Park. Korea is at the bottom of the list in renewable energy use in developed countries. Everywhere in North America, everywhere in Western Europe, Japan is way ahead of South Korea. India is ahead of South Korea. China is ahead of South Korea in the amount of renewables in its energy mix. This is a national embarrassment for such an otherwise successful country. And of course, one of the problems is that Korea does have a very, very heavy industrial structure, a very successful heavy industrial structure. But again, this brings us back to this issue of the leadership and putting in a, a, a realistic plan for upstream power generation. And let me finish with a final thought. This is not the only Korea. There is another Korea. It's the Korea, which is the poorest country in Northeast Asia. It's pretty much a black hole for everything. But I was astonished on my, my last trip to North Korea to see that in the town of Shiniju in northwestern North Korea, I saw far more use of photovoltaic than in any place I've been to in South Korea, far and away. If you're on a bus driving through Shiniju, and if you look at the roofs, or sorry, the balconies of the apartment buildings, almost everyone has a, a private solar panel. Why is this? Because the citizens can't rely on the national power grid. So, is this possibly something which we should consider adopting, that it becomes the citizen's responsibility to provide their own energy. Uh, I can't answer any of these questions. I'm not a policymaker, but these questions do need to be addressed. So, uh, you know, let's go to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Master Andrew uh, Salmon. So we need to go green and actually in order to go green, we need to have relevant leadership and actually it's all about what kind of change we can guide people to at what speed. Thank you very much uh, for your great presentation. And also I'd like to take a chance uh, to extend my appreciation to all six presenters uh, for uh, keeping in time. And now we'd like to have a panel discussion. We would like to give a a brief question uh, to each presenter, and each presenter can uh, answer in uh, three minutes. The first question uh, is directed to Director Oh Yun Sanja Suren. During your presentation, you just mentioned uh, the GCF projects and particularly the funding and investment and the projects. And also Professor Park mentioned that not only the emission reduction, but also the adaptation to climate change is equally important. They are equally important. 
So I'm just wondering whether there is any uh, project going on at the level of GCF for adaptation to climate change. Do you uh, understand the question that I directed to you? Thank you much, Ambassador. So uh, at the Green Climate Fund, adaptation financing is as important as mitigation, that is reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And we try to try to strive for 50% projects funded in mitigation and at least 50% in adaptation as well. And then we're also um, targeting by our governing instrument uh, to fund those projects in least developed countries, SIDS, but also in um, Africa. But of course, Currently, we're funding projects in more than 120 countries. Actually, our portfolio is now over 30 billion, which includes our own co-financing of about over uh, 9 billion, but with the total co-financing, it's about 30 billion. So to your question, Ambassador, on what we're trying, maybe giving an example, we use public, scarce public resources to de-risk frontier projects and leverage other funding, including to crowd in private finance to deploy the new climate solutions. And the reason is that in developing countries especially, and then as a part of, you know, we're a financing mechanism of the Paris Agreement, and we are uh, mandated by the Paris Agreement to actually support developing countries. So they face a lot of barriers to innovation, both and financing as well, both technology and financial. And then there is so much perceived risk uh, of investment. And I'm not talking about only public, but also from, especially from private sector and in adaptation. So what we're trying to do is that we're trying to de-risk investments and um, also trying to fund the difference between brown and green investments as well. So, um, Maybe I'll just explain by one example of our project, and then we do have more than 170 projects now funded. But one example, for example, of energy projects in Chile, and that's in Espejo, the Tarapaca Desert. And the project is funding what will be the world's largest hydropower station using seawater, providing an energy source. Uh, it's a combination of photovoltaic, more than 500 megawatt, and 300 megawatt pumped storage hydroelectric facility. So it's the first time, and that's the technology innovation, that the, the pumped seawater uh, will be used as a hydroelectric facility. And then also combination with the photovoltaic renewable also solves the problem of intermittency of renewable, as we all know. So this is the, uh, so we're investing in this um, innovation technology, but also it's a project size is about $1 billion. But if GCF invests the first loss equity that is the risking about of 60 million into the project that will help to raise almost one billion dollar from the uh, other investors private sector investors including for example mufg mitsubishi bank and they are accredited entity we work with more than 100 partners they're called accredited entities and uh, we also invest in capacity building but also in changing the institutional capacity, we, if needed, we also do risk the regulation, regulatory framework as well, invest in um, improving the regulations, etc. So it's important to invest in upfront capital and um, not only just, as I mentioned previously, in grants and maybe some concessional loans, it's more sort of innovative financing, equity, guaranteeing, uh, and then the risking as well. So maybe I'll stop here, Ambassador. Thank you. Yeah, 감사합니다. 네, 다음 우리 박고정 교수님. 이 탄소 중립 실현을 위해서 어, 네, 인식의 제거와 참여 인센티브. Um, in order to realize net zero, we need to raise public awareness and also we need to provide incentives to the general public. So what kind of incentives uh, could they be? 
First of all, I believe that education matters a lot. As it was mentioned by one of our presenters, education is quite important. But also, we need to actually admit the limitations of education. Education involves a discussion process. And also, education is uh, about having different opinions. So it means that we don't have to have the agreement of everybody. And that's the bottom line of education. So if we resort to education solely, that is going to take too long time and for us to achieve the goal of net zero. As an economist, what I can tell you is that education is important. But currently, Korea engages itself in Green New Deal uh, strategy implementation. And climate change related and curriculum is not included in primary school curriculum here in Korea. But from um, the perspective of economists, the realization of carbon cost uh, is uh, very important. Uh, there was a bestseller a few years ago, and, and the book uh, title was Nudge, uh, Nudge Effect. So we need to nudge people to uh, actually motivate them to uh, make behavior changes. Um, as it was mentioned by one of our presenters, we need to provide some incentives to consumers so we can guide them on to uh, take or purchase more low carbon products. So end users need to uh, bear uh, the carbon costs. Even though we talk a lot about green consumerism, um, we do not care about uh, actually giving or alloc allocating and the actual the carbon burden or cost to the consumers. Transport area is a case in point. KAU, IPS, CBAM, CTS, PRS, REC, CER, all these acronyms uh, are uh, the ones that are open used in the energy sector, but actually these acronyms are too many and too complicated to ring a bell or to resonate to the general public. So we actually need to raise public awareness by giving easy terms to make them um, understand better. Mr. Kim, I think it is um, McDonald's Korea that um, set up uh, a large flagship store for the first time in uh, the Apgujong Dong uh, in the early 1990s, and I was greatly impressed with the Big Mac, uh, the taste of it. Now McDonald's Korea is an exemplar company in ESG management. How are your consumers responding to, to your ESG management practices? We're hoping that uh, ESG uh, companies would see increase in the revenue and also in the profit. What is the actual situation in McDonald's Korea? Yes, um, with regards to ESG uh, management, thank you for recognizing us as an exemplar company. I hope that our consumers will agree with you. Before I respond, I'd like to um, show you an article. Uh, which was printed in the newspaper a few days ago. The, um, there was a ch child who wanted to eat a pizza. His, his father could not afford it, and uh, the owner of the store actually uh, gave free pizza to, uh, to this uh, father and son. And uh, the consumers responded by placing uh, enormous amounts of orders uh, to this uh, specific store. Uh, so I think uh, this is a uh, store owner with a kind heart. Uh, we want to be a company with a kind heart, likewise. Uh, that's our objective. And uh, we want to engage in the pro-environment activities, the ESG activities. And uh, uh, we want to enhance our brand image. And uh, we hope to see increase in the revenue. And... Last year, we adopted um, some of the practices, uh, such as introducing pro-environmental flagships and improving the lid and so on. And uh, I believe that the corporate image that our consumers had with us improved significantly because of our activities. And I think that has led to an increase in our revenue. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm hoping that ESG the management practices will become the, will be and uh, sustainable practice uh, through the efforts of the McDonald's in Korea. Now I have a question for Mr. Josie Wexler. 
So we're talking about the response to climate change, and it seems that there is a certain movement among the youth or the younger generation. They say that they will buy the green products only, and they will join the green companies only. So what about the youth in the UK? And also, there is a very a famous uh, British pop celebrity, uh, Paul McCartney. Sorry, Paul McCartney. He said that uh, that um, he actually engaged himself in a bid free Monday campaign. So I'm just wondering whether this kind of campaign can be a uh, actually spread uh, can be actually engaged in other areas or the other uh, the countries around the world. Yes, I, I think. There is good awareness in the UK in the amongst young people. Um, that doesn't definitely mean action, um, but there is a portion of uh, people of well of different ages who are a, a portion of consumers who are acting, and it is influencing their behaviour and what they're doing. Um, as I mentioned, there has been a reduction of meat consumption in the UK recently, and some of that I think is due to the concern around. The connection with climate change, although there has also been quite a lot of discussion about the health impacts. Um, so um, uh, I, I think the, the thing is, you're not ever going to get everybody being concerned, or I'm certainly not going to get everybody acting, um, but a portion of people can create a momentum for change, and then the rest, it has to be uh, done with, as one of the other presenters said, with the stick, and uh, with, or, and also with price changes. Um, once the there is the momentum for change, it becomes possible to put those in place, and uh, the consumers will respond to price changes, and um, and to just what options are available. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, could there be more um, popular culture? Uh, celebrities pushing this. I think that that is definitely part of it. It all helps to create a sense of momentum and it all helps to create a general society or agreement that we need to do something about this. Um, so it's helpful. I think it could be replicated more. Um, it's only going to ever going to be one portion of what needs to be done, but I think that has to be helpful. And uh, yeah, I, I think it. It, um, uh, as another person uh, pointed out, education does not lead, definitely lead to agreement. You have all sorts of different, all sorts of different perspectives through education. Um, however, I think that once you have a general societal agreement that this needs to be tackled, then it becomes much, much more easy to do things, and some consumers will start acting at that point. That's what I would say. Thank you. 예, 감사합니다. Thank you very much. Next uh, is a question we have for the Mr. Mario Salomoni. Uh, and all the panel today talked about the importance of education, about how we should reflect on the past education and uh, um, make a transition into environmental education. If you look at the, the reality that we face, as Professor Park said, we're not educating enough on the environmental issues. Uh, and one of the reasons for that would be because we have a limitation in terms of the capacity of teachers who will be teaching the environmental issues. So um, perhaps we need to enhance the capacity of these teachers. What can we do to uh, improve the capacity of the teachers? This is my question for you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this question, uh, dear Ambassador. Uh, of course, uh, according to, for example, the UNESCO guidelines, we need a whole institution approach. And uh, according to my colleague, uh, Stephen Sterling, education must be a sustainable education. That is uh, an education consistent with aims, contents, management, etc. In Korea, uh, you have best practices, for example, the eco schools proposed by the Foundation for Environmental Education. I want also to quote my friend uh, Takur Poi, the former Minister of Education of the Kingdom of Bhutan. Uh, Bhutan, uh, uh, as you know, is uh, the kingdom having uh, this uh, national happiness uh, uh, criterion uh, for uh, politics, uh, for uh, the, the government.
Ireland. And uh, in uh, the fascinating book uh, of Tancur Poidel, uh, titled My Green School, uh, translated in many languages from German to Japanese, he spoke uh, about schools and universities green due to the whole greenery, uh, natural, social, cultural, intellectual, academic, aesthetic, uh, moral uh, greenery. Uh, this uh, greenery of material, material aspects, syllabus, values, uh, architecture, organization, etc. Uh, in other words, uh, we need the greener schools and universities, uh, more other education, more relationship between inside and, and outside, between education and the global crisis we are facing, uh, between education, uh, uh, institution, and the civil society. Uh, all uh, major groups, uh, all stakeholders, uh, uh, so very important. Uh, uh, teaching must be consistent with, with message and for reaching uh, the uh, target, uh, we need uh, uh, training uh, and education of teacher, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we need uh, competencies uh, uh, for teacher, for university professor. Uh, this, there is a debate uh, all over the world uh, about competencies uh, because, uh, uh, as uh, I just said in my speech, uh, the uh, education uh, be, to be transformative, must be transformative. For this, is, we uh, must change uh, our models, our pedagogies, uh, uh, and uh, all uh, organization, all schools, uh, and the uh, university. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I have uh, one more question for Mr. Mario Salomoni. Now, do we have the problem of outdated uh, school facilities. What can we do to make a transition into green, uh, smart uh, school facilities? If we make such a transition, uh, people, some people say that, that this is actually the, in itself that the content of an edu environmental education. So uh, making a transition into green school in itself to content of uh, the environmental education. What is your take on this view? I think, uh, uh, as uh, I, I quote uh, uh, David Orr, uh, all education uh, is an uh, environmental education. Uh, so uh, all disciplines uh, are involved, uh, uh, all level uh, primary, secondary uh, schools uh, are involved. Uh, is a, a transition, a global transition. Is the world, is the, our societies are in transition. All, uh, uh, also, uh, schools and university must uh, be transitioning from an old uh, model born uh, in the past centuries uh, for a new ecological model. Is it not easy to do, of course? Uh, is uh, not so uh, uh, short as process, uh, as, uh, but we need to speed up uh, this process because uh, uh, there is no plan B, uh, as uh, the IPCC report uh, uh, the, uh, the previous uh, speaker mentioned uh, uh, says uh, that uh, we that have time, uh, we have uh, to act uh, very quickly, very strongly. Yeah, well, thank you for your the input. Now I have a question for Mr. Andrew Salmon. You just asked for an excuse, saying that you are not an expert in this specific topic uh, area, but you gave a, a Great. Um, the presentation um, expressing the expertise in this specific subject matter. So, what should be the proper response to uh, the climate change? And 
also we need to change our behaviors uh, and our, actually we need to raise a question what, uh, at what speed such kind of change uh, needs to be made so i'd like to have your personal uh, opinion on uh, the proper response to climate change and at what speed the changes should be made you're asking the wrong man but i mean <laughs> In my own personal look, uh, what do I personally do for uh, to, to save the world? Um, I mean, I will faithfully report this forum in Asia Times, so I'll contribute to the debate. And I'm very pleased to hear that the answer to a mystery: what, where the hell are the damn straws and McDonald's? Now, now I know they've been removed. So, uh, thanks to this forum, I will now drink from the cup. You know, so that's a behavioural change I'll institute next time I I go to a McDonald's. Um, but for my in my own life, I recycle uh, very diligently. Um, in the last two years, I've radically cut back on meat consumption, uh, and I love burgers. I love steaks. I love samgyeopsal, um, and. Uh, God, what else have I done? Oh, and I'm, I'm very, very careful about my power use. But my motivation force for all these things is completely separate to the environmental catastrophe. I recycle because I'm legally required to recycle. So there's the stick. Uh, I've cut back on meat consumption for my health. That's the carrot. Um, and I, I'm very, very careful about my electricity consumption for my own economy. So again, this is the, these my motivational r demands are not th the planet. They're you know they're for my own benefit, and I, I think we need to make these changes very immediate uh, to the consumer, be it coercion or be it reward. <laughs> I agree that what you do for yourself is something you do for the planet. And uh, this uh, brings us uh, to the, the uh, close of uh, this session. So we just wrapped up our discussions. Uh, and uh, we uh, anticipated a lot of uh, questions uh, from the audience, uh, but because they're not able to hold an offline conference, we won't be able to entertain questions from the audience. Uh, we are look forward to another opportunity to address uh, the questions that you may have. And uh, with this, uh, now uh, we uh, just held the plenary session. Uh, and uh, we uh, can uh, say that, that the greed is uh, indeed the cause of the climate crisis. Uh, and as uh, Ms., uh, Professor Salimon uh, said, uh, uh, it is because of the greed that we are that we have run into a situation like this. So we need to make efforts uh, to um, reduce uh, the, the harm that's been done already. And uh, we need to do it in a sustainable manner. Uh, for in, to ensure sustainability, that this is a time uh, concept. Uh, in order to achieve uh, sustainability, we need to be quite embracing, encompassing in terms of the spatial concept. Uh, so we need participation of various stakeholders to, to this end. And in this, uh, uh, there is, are certain contributions that we can make as, as consumers, uh, the companies, stakeholders, academia, that to the international co global community. And through such a various uh, participation, we will be able to realize uh, a sustainable uh, planet. Uh, and we will be able to realize uh, living, uh, um, the, the realize the main theme of uh, today's uh, uh, the forum, which is our lives in a sustainable environment. And with this, I'd like to bring uh, the session to, to a close. I'd like to thank you for your all your very positive contributions. So with this, I'd like to conclude this session. Thank you very much for your participation. 네, 고맙습니다. 기후위기 타파의 유일한 해법, 탄소 중립 실현을 위해서 어떻게 해야 하는지 심도 깊게 논의해 주셨네요. Thank you very much, Ambassador Yu. Uh, we actually need to uh, achieve net zero as a sustainable uh, the solution for our future. It has been a precious opportunity for all of us to think about what we can do to achieve. Uh, this great goal. I'd like to take this opportunity to extend my appreciation to all the participants and the presenters once again. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we just uh, concluded uh, the, the plenary session, and uh, you remember that we have had uh, visual thinking uh, drawings uh, displays at the end of every session. And uh, now I like to put it up on the screen. Thank you very much. This visual uh, thinking picture will be posted on Instagram account of Changsun Forum. I hope you will enjoy this uh, visual thinking picture. This concludes the first day of Changsun Forum 2021. It's been half day, uh, composed of different sessions, and also it has been a great time for all of us to discuss various topics and issues. Tomorrow, we will continue the second day of Changsun Forum 2021, and the YouTube channel and the Gangwon Province official website channel will uh, live stream, uh, uh, I mean, broadcast uh, the session um, through a live streaming. There will be Earth session, Enterprise session, Gangwon session, and also talk concert. Please uh, stay with us for the second day of Cheongsan Forum. I'd like to take this opportunity to extend my appreciation to all the participants once again. I My name is Park San Young, and I have been moderating on the first day of uh, Cheongsan Forum. Thank you. Forum, 20...